Without further delay, I'd like to introduce our library administration consultant, Sandy Newell. Sandy. Hello. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I want to say welcome to everyone out in our virtual uh, institute participants. This is our first Florida, Florida Libraries as People's University. Uh, we we're going to do a day long from 10 to 4 o'clock series of sessions. This is all part of our initiative called Florida Libraries as. This month has been Florida Libraries as Learning Center. Uh, the November, December was community memory, January was e-government, and March we'll be doing business incubators. We have an exciting day planned, highlighting a few different ways our libraries are key educational partners. We have five sessions, all of them on Eastern Time, even though we do know the Panhandle west of us is Central. Each of our sessions will run 50 minutes followed by a 10-minute break uh, in between. And we'll start each session on the top of the hour. Now, we're actually copying this format from the Nebraska State Library. They actually use it for their, um, their day-long uh, uh, conference. Talk from you know how you did this? Because and, I don't any of them. Um, this was just held uh, February 20th, so uh, lots of good um, programs that they do during that session. Today we're going to give you two chances to ask questions. Uh, go ahead and put your questions and comments in chat. <clears throat> you saw, heard from Melissa where to do this. We're going to monitor these and read them out loud at times. Our last hour though, as you see, is at 3 o'clock from the agenda on the screen. From 3 to 4 is really for more discussions and your questions. And we also want to hear from you some of the things that you're planning or are actually doing related to Florida Libraries as Learning Centers. We are recording the day and we'll post each session up online along with the PowerPoints you're seeing. And all of today's presenters are actually from Florida except our last. Uh, the last session uh, is on building a living library and it's at 2 o'clock as you see on the agenda. And our, we have presenters from the 2014 Rural Library of the Year in Colorado. So here's the, the flow of the day, and you're still seeing the agenda. Our first session is on partnering at, with educational institutions. And you and I know that libraries can do a lot more if we form partnerships and team with partners. Then we'll move on to 11 o'clock, where we'll discuss the evolving roles of staff. We're going to be introducing to you two perspectives on the changing roles. One's from Urban Tampa and the other is Citrus County. Known for its many springs, some of you might be familiar with uh, Homosassa State Park, which is an old Florida attraction down there. We'll spend lunch time together uh, on learning about services to seniors and a program from Pasco County related to teens and seniors. Then at 1 o'clock, we're going to cover two programs on adult literacy. This session is a long-standing adult literacy program from Jacksonville and a volunteer literacy program in Citrus County. Testing. Testing. Hi, Isabel. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We end our session hearing about how a library uh, built a living library. And then, as I mentioned, at 3 o'clock, we'll have a discussion together. So this tells you what the day looks like, putting in questions about the dynamics of the day into chat. Now, there are a diversity of programs out there. Today's session is just a sample of educational programs provided in our libraries across the state. There's a lot we're not covering. We don't have anything in today's institute on hobbies, like knitting classes, which we know you're doing, book discussions, which have long been an educational opportunity in our libraries, and food uh, classes is a real hot topic in, in today's world, and certainly homework help, and more and more. We know there's a lot out there on maker spaces and in learning labs, and um, soon to open up 
labs. Orlando here in Florida was the first one that opened up their um, um, their makerspace, and I can't remember what they call it, but they had a large endowment that helped them open that up. Uh, Tampa calls their space the Hive, and there are many models, large and small, in our libraries. The makerspace concept is relatively new and attention-getting, and really is a whole separate day to itself as far as programs go. The programs we've covered today are targeting Florida's um, college students, teens, seniors, low-educated adults, and anyone who wants to learn more about gardening. One thing we know is that learning needs to be practical, fun, and worthwhile. So our session today is to get you thinking. What learning programs are currently provided by your library that you can actually brand as educational? What are the unmet needs in your community that the staff library could step in and to fill? <laughs> and then another important piece is how can you capture the impact of these learning-based programs? I have the pleasure of introducing Jean Capola. Oh, let me pass on to this. Uh, you see here a lot of the, the, the content and the ideas come from uh, Libraries Igniting Learning, this uh, leadership brief that's available on, at the Urban Libraries Council. So if you want to know more about the concept, go to this um, URL, or really just go to the Urban Libraries Council and, and put in leadership uh, brief, or Libraries and Ignite Learning and you'll get to uh, some good background content. Now the central role in delivering programs from that brief are you need to have high quality, the programs need to be purposeful and intentional. So a lot of it depends on going steps beyond what our traditional information, reference, even story time role. Because when you're doing a purposeful program, an intentional, intentional program, you really want to prepare the um, customer for lifelong learning. So it's not just I come into the library and I ask for uh, a question about, I want to take the GED test. Go a lot further than that. The voices we got back there. Gene, is that you? No, it's somebody <laughs> on the phone. Yeah, that's what we figured. <laughs> um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Gene Coppola, the director of the Palm Harbor Library and incoming president of the Florida Library Association. He's also been a longtime advisor for our new public library directors in Florida. So Gene, why don't you start with providing context on where you work your overall philosophy, and tell us the temperature it's down, is down in Palm Harbor. <laughs> Good morning, all, and thank you, Sandy, for that wonderful introduction. And as you can tell by my picture, uh, you know who I root for now. Even though I live here in Florida, I still have those New York roots. Yes, I do root for the Giants, nothing against the Bucks, but I uh, just want to put that out there. Uh, as far as libraries are concerned, um, when Sandy asked me to participate this morning, uh, uh, well, when, whenever Sandy asked me to do something, I would say yes, so <laughs> there was there was a no-brainer. I wanted to talk a little bit about this morning about the, the partnerships that the Palm Harbor Library has been able to create uh, over the years, and uh, and, I've re and I've said this story to, to so many people, so hopefully I'm not repeating myself to, to all of you today. The first day I started work, <clears throat> back in uh, 2000, the very first day, I think it may have been even the second or third hour of that first day, uh, I went to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Palm Harbor is located in an unincorporated community. Uh, we are not part of a city nor county structure, so we uh, get to do a lot of things down here that uh, we may not be able to do elsewhere. Uh, and I went to go to the Chamber because I always found that the Chamber was one of the major um, uh, players in any community. And I introduced myself, and they had me there for five minutes. I, was I, knew. Uh, I was a member, and I got on the board within a, a year or so. Uh, I've been involved with them for quite some time. They're very helpful. 
Um, matter of fact, in 2005, I was very honored to serve as their uh, chairman of the board, um, which, which gave, me great, it gave me great satisfaction to know that as a librarian, I was heading a board of business people, so I was able to uh, bring the library uh, to be a, um, a player at the community table. And I know that's a used up phrase and we all hear it so often, but it's so true. You need to be part of the decision making process because if not, people will make the decisions for you and we never want to be in that position. We want to be part of the, we want to be the conductor, at least one of the conductors. What you're seeing in front of you now is one of the wonderful results in that partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I also sit on the uh, Chamber's Foundation Board and for many, many years they've had this uh, uh, scholarship foundation <coughs> for they give out monies to uh, scholarships for, for seniors in, in, in the area. Um, but that's all they did and I thought that maybe we should do should be able to do something more because this was a very almost like a secretive type of uh, scholarship foundation. So through uh, a series of discussions and compromises and so forth, uh, the net result is what you see in front of you, which is that the foundation has decided to give all of their money, which is close to $10,000, to the library, and we keep it in a separate account, and we use that money on an annual basis to promote and support the teen room that we have here at the library, which we've now entitled the Frank A. Wiener uh, Palmer Chamber of Commerce Foundation teen room. And what you see is a wonderful cake, and believe me, it was delicious. It was made by Publix, and I'll always go back there again. But this cake really represents a wonderful turnout from the teens and the chamber members and community members, and it was a, it was a great opportunity to bring a lot of people together, and it was a way to promote the chamber and the library and support for the teens. Uh, so this was a wonderful relationship, and, and I will always continue it in so many ways. As a matter of fact, the first Thursday of every month in, um, at 7.30 in the morning, the library hosts the monthly chamber breakfast meetings in which we have usually about 50 people here. Uh, great networking opportunities. The library's high uh, profile has risen. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So I've always been uh, an advocate of, of, of the chamber. Uh, we've had other partnerships over the years, and here's another one. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, as, you, as Tanny was saying before, many of us, we have uh, book clubs. And uh, years ago, I started a, a book club, and we had so many people, I had to put one in the morning and one in the evening. Well, what happened was the, eve, the, 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 the one during the day still worked very, very well, but the one in the evening petered out. So we had to reboot it. So this is a 2.0 type of new book club. And we decided instead of having it on site, let's do something a little bit different. So we connected with our local tavern, uh, Peggy O'Neill's in downtown Palm Harbor, and we decided to call it Ales and Tales. And uh, we took their, their logo and we changed it a bit. Uh, not just putting the little beer glass on the book, uh, but if you take a closer look, we had to add, we had to add a little bit more uh, garment to this young lady's attire because we wanted to make more of a family-friendly type of logo. Uh, Peggy O'Neill's agreed, and now we have our Ales and Tales Evening Book Club. Uh, we do it on a rotating basis with six other librarians, so we get to do this book club twice a year. Uh, our first session, we had about what, 16 people there. <clears throat> I don't know if there was more time talking about the book or reading the beer, but either way, they had a good time. They knew it was a library endeavor, great partnership with the local tavern, and uh, truly a good time was had by all. So I think this may end up being one of our best outreach endeavors in a long, long time to come. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, then, uh, and Sandy had mentioned this before too, uh, about makerspace. Uh, as you probably all aware, that's, that's the hot thing a lot of libraries are doing and so forth. We did, uh, we took it in a little bit of a different direction. Not to say we are unique in this, but I think we're in the minority of libraries doing this. Instead of doing the makerspaces for the adults, we decided to do it for the kids. And we're doing it for like uh, elementary age, early elementary age. And the reason why is because, at least in Palm Harbor Library, like in other libraries, we found a little niche. And our niche is that we've evolved more into a cultural destination through the visual and the performing arts. And we feel that in some of our schools, 
Uh, and this may be the same in, in your areas too. But we have found in some of our local schools, the art department seems to be cutting back. And there seems to be less of an emphasis on the arts. Granted, STEM is very, very important. We need to promote science and technology so we can become uh, um, a, 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 a predominant uh, country in the world as far as the sciences are concerned. However, uh, I've always felt that to be a truly well-rounded individual, you need to include the arts in your life. And what better time to start when you are young? Start developing that appreciation for, for the Monets and the Matisses and so forth. So what we decided to do was, through private funding, not one tax dollar was used. We have created this maker space to allow kids to come in for the time to create whatever we want. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, things, that buttons and, and all, all kinds of interesting things. The kids decide what they want to do and they can create it. Now here's the problem though. None of them ever want to leave their artwork behind so we can show it to other kids. They're just so proud of it. They just take it home with them. Uh, this young lady that you see here at the podium when we had the grand opening uh, is Angela Katz. She's a leading community activist who promotes libraries and is very supportive of providing uh, the arts for kids and teens and adults in the community. The Hazel El Incantalupo Makerspace is crazy Italian names. That is, uh, was named after an individual who passed away, who is the mother of one of our staff members here, and the family has decided to make it their thing. And it was a wonderful thing how they've embraced the arts. So this is one way that we, we've partnered somewhat with the schools and with the community and provided, and of course, all this is free. We want the kids to be exposed to the arts. It's an important endeavor. And we have other plans in, in the near future. Uh, but this was really important for us. Uh, partnerships with learning institutions. Uh, yes, that's <laughs> I love that old bookmobile uh, with the horse and everything else. Um, but as you can see, we started a long time ago. And I think as libraries, as an institution, we've become very sophisticated over the years. And how do we reach out? Um, to partnerships. Uh, yes, we do a lot of online, which is, which is a good thing to do. You reach more. But I'm a little old-fashioned. I still like the face-to-face, -face, handshake, one-on-one uh, -on -one type of scenario where you really can make that bonding um, with, with community members. Let's see, what's the next slide that we have here? Yes, okay. Now, here's a, a great partnership that we created. I've always been an advocate of, uh, for a long, long time, of how we're missing the boat as, as at least public libraries uh, by not partnering with your local academic libraries. Uh, all library disciplines, public, academic, special, media specialists, the whole nine yards, um, we all are different we, in the sense that we have different focuses. However, I think we share similar philosophies and missions of service and so forth. And I think we're missing the boat unless we uh, cooperate and, and, and work with one another. Um, I've always felt that we need to reach out to the academic libraries. And actually, I have found over the years that the academic libraries always seem to be uh, just a little bit more ahead of the curve than public libraries. Uh, for example, uh, when I visited USF and UCF, they have the wonderful learning commons uh, initiatives. So I took some of their ideas, and I'm incorporated here in Palm Harbor Library. Uh, it's not to the extent of what the universities are offering, but it's an idea of creating more of a gathering place, a place where people can come and collaborate and so forth. And I was inspired by the academic libraries. Now here's another initiative. Two years ago, I reached out to St. Pete College Library, Tarpon Springs campus. And at the time, we, they had a very innovative director that was willing to, uh, to reach out to me too. And we had a mini joint staff development day with their library staff and my library staff coming together to decide what can we do together? Uh, what, can, what commonalities exist? Uh, what timelines are there that we can, uh, that, that would be beneficial to the two of us so we can do things collectively? And we came, we came away with some ideas and besides the networking which was a given, probably the most uh, tangible thing we came away from was offering a ACECON. Uh, which is, as you can see, an anime and comic um, enthusiast uh, convention. And what we did was, on a weekend, uh, it was a two-day event where on, uh, on a Saturday, 
the live Palmer Library hosted the first part of that ACECON where most of the vendors were here. And then the second day we had at the college campus. And we come to find that a lot of the kids that participated in this uh, were similar. They both they both went to both institutions. And, and, and the ones that didn't go to either, either institutions, they were like new uh, members, the new students, and new advocates, libraries. And besides the bonding that you can see there between Superwoman and a couple of my staff members there, uh, it was a great, great thing that we can talk and actually create something, and we're going to be doing that again. Uh, probably not this year, not this year, but probably next year, we're going to have another joint staff development day between both libraries, because I think there are so many wonderful opportunities there that local institutions can gather together and, and, and collaborate with one another. And this is just one small thing. Uh, I heard recently from a, a buddy of mine, Brian Smith, out in uh, Palm Beach, that they recently did something out over there, which is uh, very innovative. So uh, we're, uh, I'm going to be talking to him to see maybe we can uh, not steal, but share some of the resources and ideas that uh, the guys were doing out over there. Uh, earlier I was talking to you about a uh, um, um, partnerships with different types of uh, communities and also that the library being a cultural destination. What you see in front of you is an actual sculpture, outside sculpture of the library uh, in twilight that's coming to light. Uh, and this was done through uh, partnering with the Pinellas County uh, Arts Council. Uh, years ago, a uh, very short, quick story, years ago, um, the Pinellas Arts Council, before the recession hit, were giving out grants to different uh, community groups throughout Pinellas County to provide art in their communities. Uh, for those of you, as an example, who have, been, who have had the pleasure of maybe being to in Chicago, uh, not during the winter time, but during the summertime or spring, uh, will fall find that there's many wonderful pieces of art in, in so many areas in the city. Uh, and Pinellas County, to a certain extent, were trying to do that. Um, so they gave two pieces of artwork in downtown Palm Harbor, which was fine. But the problem was is that nobody asked for it downtown. And the two art pieces that they gave was very futuristic. And, and, the, and the area in downtown Palm Harbor was very like 19th century. So it didn't mesh too well, and the people were a little upset about it. I, I went to the county and said, we'll take those art pieces, put it here at the library. I think it'd be great. They said, no, we're going to keep it where it is. Uh, so then I went for the next three years to the, to, the, to the Arts Council advocating and asking if they'd be willing to give a grant to the library so we can provide art here at the library. Finally, they agreed, and probably one of the best things I did in my entire career was to be part of that eight-month uh, period where we put out a call to artists uh, to, to do provide a, a, a sculpture and art at the library, uh, and we had over 120 applications, of which about, I think, 15 or 20 came from, uh, uh, from Europe. Uh, we ended up, the finalist was... Uh, um, uh, I think one from Florida, uh, one from New Orleans, and I think one from California. And I really wanted one from Florida, but even though her her work seemed good, her presentation bombed. Uh, but we went with this artist instead, uh, Michael Kane from New Orleans, and this was a little bit after Katrina, so I felt good that we were able to help him, a struggling artist from, from that city. One of the stipulations I made in the sculpture is I wanted it to be outside so people can see it, and I wanted it to be lit so people can see it 24 hours a day. So the sculpture you see in front of you is at night, and I'll tell you something. Uh, it, it, as, as lovely as this picture is, it really doesn't do the justice uh, when you see it in person. Uh, we've, we've almost become... Um, um, this has almost become iconic in the community where people see this wonderful piece of, of sculpture. And it's, it's gratifying to know that I've only had one person in the years that we've had the sculpture here come up to me and say, I don't get it, what it's all about. I said, well, you have to look at it. It's art. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a nice piece. It's a wonderful piece. It was $50,000. We didn't have to pay one dime for it. And uh, it, a lot came out of it. And one of the byproducts is that we firmed up and bonded a little bit closer to county government, which was always very, very helpful. So this really put a, uh, um, uh, a real um, a, a final thing on us being a cultural destination. So I was very, very happy about that. Um, this is an exhibit 
of a, <clears throat> a traveling Smithsonian exhibit of some um, artifacts from the Historical Museum in Palm Harbor. Uh, I've always felt that we should, the public library should be a place of education and learning and so forth. And I wanted to do something more with the Palm Harbor Historical Museum. So what we've done now is we have a rotating exhibit at the library, a dedicated space of this exhibit where every month um, um, pieces, of, uh, some of the artifacts will come from the Historical Museum and be placed here so people will always see some of the history of where they live. Uh, we get about uh, maybe about thirteen, fourteen thousand people uh, per month. Uh, that kind of foot traffic uh, on a monthly basis. So this really um, uh, shows of the history, and it's always being rotated. And we just give them the space. They come in. They take care of the rest. Um, and I find that like with with the chamber in the teen room, and some of the other organizations that we have here. Um, that we should be the focal point of our, of our community. I know we say that in public libraries. I strongly believe that uh, we should be the p a place where people can come and get the information. And that partnership with the Historical Museum has probably been one of the better ones around. Uh, here's my buddy, uh, buddy Mr. Rogers. Um, uh, and let's see, when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say to me, but for the helpers, you'll always find people who are helping. And that's what we do here at the library, as I'm sure you do uh, with I, yourself, too. I so I, I find that very helpful. Yes? I was going to jump in and talk a little bit about oh, community-wide learning coalitions. We do yes. have several libraries across uh, Florida that participate in these learning coalitions. And one example is from the Alachua County Library District, actually in Gainesville. And they convened, uh, had a, a summit, I don't know exactly what they called it, where they pulled together everybody that was connected with adult literacy, adult learning in the sense of folks without a high school diploma. And they looked around and they did some needs assessment to see what was uh, available in Gainesville and what was not. And the one program that was not available in Gainesville was a volunteer literacy program. So because of, they formed this coalition and the library actually runs, started up and runs the volunteer literacy program uh, in that county. Um, another example of coalitions, and many of the folks here in our virtual room are familiar with these, there are 30 early learning coalitions out there. And these are nonprofits that get federal and state funding. And I know a good number of our libraries are on these coalitions. I know that uh, the Marion County Library has done some interesting things uh, on uh, early literacy related to that. So I just wanted to jump in and do a heads up on that. And Sandy, at this point, uh, I just want to talk briefly about one of the things we did here in Palm Harbor. Uh, it doesn't exist today, but it, it, it's, its legacy it remains. Um, when uh, we, when Alachua did that, I wanted to do something uh, comparable here in, in Palm Harbor. And so the library um, um, convened a summit uh, a few years ago with uh, approximately 35 nonprofits here to find out what we can do to help each other. And this is like the ultimate partnership in the, in the community. We called it FAN. Um, PHAN, Palm Harbor Agencies for Nonprofit, and the idea being is, is that how can we help each other as nonprofits without uh, spending extra, any extra money? And is there any commonalities that we can work with one another? Uh, we have members from the museums, from the chamber, uh, from the pregnancy center, from the food bank. And what we found is that there were some things we could do with one another. For example, if one group needed an, a, a meeting room for free and another had it, uh, they would help each other out there. If one group wanted uh, uh, information to be posted uh, for the community and they didn't have a road sign and another did, uh, they would post it. So it was a real nice meeting of the minds um, and the networking that was created uh, was wonderful. I, I, I got to know a lot of other people in the community I wouldn't have known before. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge endeavor. But if anybody would like any information on what we did in our community to try to pull nonprofits together to create that ultimate partnership of networks and, and, and getting to know one another, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody about that. Um, if I had to do it over again, I would. I would do it a little differently to do better sustain it. But it was a wonderful thing. Uh, and it's something I think they were trying out in Lakeland, too. 
um, but it, 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 it was a good thing. Uh, now here, um, we talk about partnerships, and there's all kinds of partnerships. But I think when we do talk about partnerships, our knee-jerk response is to go outside of the library, to do outreach, to do those partnerships with the chamber and the museums and so forth that I was talking about. But I want to emphasize something. Don't forget probably one of the most important partnerships, one of the most important partnerships, which is your own library, your own staff. I find that uh, you have many wonderful people within your own organization. And unless you talk to them, and unless you hear them, you may not discover the multiple talents and skill sets and interests that they have that they can bring to your organization other than just their, their task. Here, uh, we recently, this is my staff, recently uh, for Staff Development Day, we usually would have had a theme like uh, um, uh, technology or customer service and then we have some workshops and whatever and, and, and that was all fine. But I wanted to do something a little bit different this year and I wanted to bring the staff together to do something collectively. So what we did, did was this time we went to a Pino's Palette which was a local art studio. Uh, we picked out a particular painting that we wanted to do and we all got our own canvases and we all painted our own picture. And uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be exhibiting all that in our art alcove uh, next month. And it was a it really was great, it, it, even though we had, and the idea being, even though we had a similar mission, in this case, to this painting of this woman in, in a doorway in a house at night, we all brought different perspectives to it, and I think that's what this was all about, was to identify the partnership within your own library, within your own organization, and how you can promote it, embrace it. And, and, and just let it go. And it, and it really was a great, great time. And uh, we may do something similar next year. I'm thinking, as Stan was mentioning before, about uh, cooking classes. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe doing something like that and just uh, um, uh, partnering with a local restaurant and having us all go out and cook a meal together. So that's uh, I think that's on the agenda for, for, for next year. But uh, that's what this uh, picture is uh, all about. Uh, no, that's not me uh, uh, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, um, although my hair does look like that today, it is it is a little bit shorter today. Uh, but this is just reminding you that we need to embrace a central educational role. I don't know, Sandy, if you want to mention or say anything at this point. Absolutely, uh, libraries need to do more at embracing the role of education and it goes further than, than simple learning. Learning is actually passive whereas if you brand yourself as an educational institution that's a much more proactive role for libraries to, uh, to play. And I do want folks that um, uh, to share on chat things that they've been doing and we also can take questions at any point on chat so if you want to put in questions, we're going to encourage you to go ahead and do that at this point. And Sandy, I was going to ask you, um, it looks like we're doing okay with time right mm -hmm. now, and I don't know if we had a slide for this, uh, but I wanted to know if I could, t do I have a little time to talk about our relationship with the art museum that we have here? Yes, yeah, we do. Oh, okay. Uh, let me talk a little bit about that, because I found that to be helpful too. Um, we like I said, primary libraries evolved more into a culture destination, and, and we've done that not just by having an art alcove and a maker space and so forth, uh, but we do we have developed a wonderful, wonderful relationship uh, with the local art museum, the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art, uh, which has an emphasis on 20th and 21st century art. And what we've done with them. Uh, their director and curator has uh, come into the library and has served as judges in selecting uh, 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 jury quality art to exhibit in our art alcove. Um, and what we have done over there, uh, one of my staff members does a leap into art, which is an art program geared for children. Uh, she brings up a famous artist and gives them an opportunity to paint like that famous artist so they can get involved in that. Uh, I do an art book club uh, with 20th century art. Uh, we do that every other month. 
Um, this month we're going to be doing Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, in the past, we've done obviously we've done Picasso and and um, and uh, Pollock and 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 the rest. Uh, also, um, they uh, the the curator director and myself have also been involved for for three years with the local annual art festival in downtown Palm Harbor. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever worked with artists before, but um, let's put it this way. Uh, they see the world much differently from you and I. So that's always a very interesting experience. But that's turned out to be a great, great relationship between the museum and ourselves. Uh, the one thing that uh, we are doing, we are planning to do and unveil it during National Library Week, is uh, doing something more for the children with the performing arts. As with the art studio, um, and the arts seem to be disappearing from the schools, so is uh, music. It seems as if that's another area that's being uh, cut back. So we're, we're trying to fill in the void a little bit. So in the middle of uh, during National Library Week, we are going to be unveiling a brand new uh, musical instrument collection where with one library card, you can borrow a musical instrument from the library. And this is going to be geared for elementary uh, children, maybe a little bit above. We're going to see how that works. And in turn, I'm hoping that this will uh, foster some wonderful relationship with, uh, with local musicians and music stores and so forth. Um, the performing arts is also very, very important, and we want to try and fill in that board. So um, it, 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 it should be interesting. So we're moving in that direction. And what's our next slide? Uh, we're actually open for questions at this point. This is Patrick. I'd, I'd like to ask a question to everybody. Uh, we had some folks join mid-session. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. What we'd like to know is if anybody um, is, is logged in or joining by phone but has other people in the room with them who are also uh, uh, attending our session today, if you could just type into chat um, or let us know if you have, if you have uh, more than one person with you attending the session today, I would really appreciate it. And so we'd like to hear from you, your questions for Jean, or share some of the things that you're doing. We have about 10 more minutes that if we've set aside for questions, we'll end at 10 to 11 with this session and then start up at 11 with our next uh, session. So any comments, questions, etc.? While you're doing that, I'm going to share something related to music that I learned last week. I was down at the Palm Beach County Library System. And that library, as um, many of you do, actually has a policy and a process for accepting uh, local authors, books by local authors. They put them in three of their libraries. But they're going to do something different in the context of music. They are going to actually have an a application process where musicians from the Palm Beach County area can apply to have their actual song be put uh, on the library's website. And hmm. so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. That's very cool. Yeah, it's a, a very interesting twist to the library role. So maybe you could, people will check out those instruments, Gene, and then they could give you a song, too. <laughs> I can't wait to be serenaded. <laughs> so, any questions in that? And we're also posting out some uh, links uh, to you on a variety of things. Susan says, love the arts being incorporated into library services. Yes, it, it, it's a nice match. I'd like to ask if anybody who's listening, is there any unique partnerships that you have created uh, that, that you would like to share? Um, I think most of the stuff that I do, uh, if not all, is not unique. It's listening to all of what other libraries are doing and trying to incorporate it locally. Is there anybody out there doing anything that's, that's interesting or, or successful or unique? And I know we have some academic libraries. Uh, I don't know if they're in on this particular session. We have a comment from Karen Crisco who says, yes, what, uh, 
partnering with migrant centers. That's great. You want to say a little bit more about what you're doing, Karen? We'll let her type in and then... Susan also writes uh, that they've partnered with the Daughters of the American Revolution and Sons of the American Revolution for awesome events such as Flag Day. That's great. What is Flag Day? While we're waiting for somebody to type in, uh, I want to talk about another um, partnership that we're creating, which I think is, is, uh, uh, is a very important one. Uh, we're trying to develop more of a partnership with the local domestic abuse shelter, the Haven. Uh, one thing we've done with them, and it was a tri partnership, Tampa Bay Library Consortium has a brand new uh, videographer, and what we decided to do was to video, uh, videotape uh, six domestic uh, uh, abuse um, workshops. Uh, we posted them on our uh, website, uh, so people have access to it because they were Apparently, there was um, many people were afraid to attend them in person, so we have made it uh, possible so they can access them that way. And also, we're partnering with the Haven uh, with asking some of the women there that are interested in creative to create works of art, which we in turn will eventually uh, exhibit here at the library. And I think that's going to be a wonderful endeavor. So I'm hoping that whole thing will come together soon. Uh, Karen uh, followed up uh, with a comment that it's the youth services staff who are offering story times uh, to promote literacy to children and the families um, as part of the partnership with Migrant Centers. And uh, Susan elaborated that uh, Flag Day takes place June 14th and Constitution Day is on September 17th, that they've had events in all five branches with lots of pomp and circumstance, i.e. George Washington, Betsy Ross sewing the flag. <laughs> nice. And I know another interesting partnership, Jean, you talked about in another webinar you did a, a couple years back was with the funeral home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and here's a tip for all of you, because this could work anywhere in, anywhere in the country. Uh, what is the one business that will never go out of business? and that is funeral homes. So during a recession when I needed some money to create this reading terrace for, for kids in our children's room, uh, usually banks would be sponsoring that kind of endeavor. And we were looking for about $1,000, but banks were running out of money, nobody had anything. So I did, I did a cold call at a local funeral home, and um, after talking with them, they said yes. So we received $1,000 from the funeral home to buy this reading terrace for the kids, they in turn were able to come in and provide some generic presentations on funeral services. We slapped their name on the side of the reading terrace and, and it was good. And I think it's time for me to go back and talk to them because I'm telling you something. And they have money, they will always have money. And didn't you have a coffin exhibit or something in their, in their library? Well, I'm sorry, what was that? Did, did you have a coffin with an exhibit? Yeah, the coffin was the yeah. <laughs> they, provided, they provided a coffin where we had our uh, ho teen Halloween party. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty wild. Uh, Jana you know, has her hand up. Jana, go ahead with your question. Okay, Jana. Jana has written. If you have a, a mall near you, partner with them to offer story times for the public. Thank you, Jenna. And Susan has done that in Citrus County. One of the things we didn't do at the beginning that I meant to is have everybody introduce yourself. So why don't you go ahead and type that into uh, chat, <clears throat> and if you want to make a comment as you do that, we'll share it with the um, audience. <clears throat> so you know, say who you are, what organization, library you represent, and what town you're in. And if you want to share the temperature, you can share that. So we have Bonnie from Broward. Karen from Palm Beach County, who I was just talking about. Oh, I, I skipped through, but here's Rachel. 
So you see we have a good, a good mix of people here. Even somebody from Palm Harbor or Literacy Council. Yay. <laughs> Which they are housed at the library, is that right? Um, that is correct. Right. So you, you provide space, they actually manage the program. I, I would do anything for the former Librarian of the Year, Diana Severia, yes. <laughs> uh, got several people uh, from Citrus County. And Christina from St. John's River State College. Sandy joining mm -hmm. from the Orange County Library System in Orlando. Laura from Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library. And Vic, currently unemployed, semi-retired librarian who has a story. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. Can I think we have a position up there? <laughs> <laughs> What we're, folks are doing are introducing themselves. We've got about another four minutes that we can talk about partnerships, uh, and then we'll sign off. Sign off. Everything will get quiet. We'll have ten minutes in between before we start our next session at eleven o'clock on the evolving role of staff. And this is Melissa. Um, if you would like to join us for the next session, don't disconnect your computer. Just stay right on where you are. Um, we'll do the same, and we'll start up at eleven. This is Patrick. Yeah. If you won't be joining us uh, any further today, I would like to um, encourage you to complete a survey, which you'll be re uh, receiving after the session. Uh, we, we value your feedback. Now, will the survey come after this actual session, or it'll be after the day? It'll be after they leave the session, after we close the session. At the end of the day? Okay. The only other thing I'd like to mention is that if anybody would like to talk further about anything say, that we've done here or if they would like to share with me what they've done, uh, please please call me, contact me. Uh, Sandy would tell you I love to talk to people. I love to listen to people. Um, and if there's something that you – so if you want to know anything further, I, I would make myself more than uh, available to talk to anybody and share my successes as well as all my failures. Um, so please, please contact me at your convenience. I, I, I really would like to, uh, to hear from you and talk with you. And, and it is a good thing to share the failures so others can learn from your experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just remember, if you walk away with anything today, funeral homes have money. They never go out of business. <laughs> they got so much they don't know what to do with it. And we do have a comment. Um, Susan's saying that funeral partnership was definitely out of the box, Jean. <laughs> and we're out of the coffin. <laughs> if you don't ask, you're not going to get it. The worst they can say is no. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Please hang on, go, go to the bathroom, grab a snack, and be back at 11. Thank you for your fine comments, Anna. Hi, all, and thank you for coming. Sandy, anything else I can do for you today? Oh, okay. <laughs> I had to be unmuted. Um, I think we're good, Jean. You know, if you happen to want to pop back in at uh, at uh, three o'clock for the discussion, you're welcome, but you don't need to. Yeah, unfortunately, I have a, a medical appointment this afternoon. If not, I, I would have joined you. Uh, but let me know if you ever do anything like this again. If I can help or change what I did, uh, I'd be more than happy to to do whatever I can for you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Bye. You're all and welcome. Have a good day. Good luck. Bye.
Okay, now we're back. I don't know where we went to, but we did go somewhere. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Laura, let's go ahead and have you uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, how long you've worked in their library, your job responsibilities, etc. Okay. Um, well, I work at the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library, and I started three and a half years ago, um, and that was my first time in a library. This is the only library I've worked in, and my background is in early childhood education, and I got, um, I was a former, I'm a former kindergarten teacher, and so because of that background, I went and got my media specialist certification along with my MLS, and I was hired into a youth services position here. And um, during that time, I participated in traditional reference and programming. Um, you're just uh, what you expect from a youth services librarian on the desk, giving uh, baby time uh, at the desk reference. And we also, because I work at the downtown library, which is our main uh, main branch, we also worked on system-wide programming. So we created box programs that could be circulated out to the branches um, to help with programming out there. Um, then I moved into digital services, and I got to learn um, some basic HTML, and I worked with our internal and external websites. I helped launch our library on Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, Yelp, and Pinterest, and I wrote for our kids' blog. And I also um, got to be a representative for, because we were a county library system, so we work with other county departments, and we actually met with other county representatives who were doing social media for their departments. So I got to be a part of that committee and hear what they were doing and give advice. Um, based on our experiences. Um, we also designed and implemented an iPad story time, and I got to be involved with our OverDrive um, migration to a new platform and our migration to a new ILS Polaris. Um, so it was neat to be part of that in digital services. And um, also as part of digital services, I got to help write a grant uh, to bring StoryCorps equipment and training to our library. And then I got to also help implement and manage that grant. And we also launched our digital collections during that time, um, and I can give a link to that later. Um, but basically, it's a big archive collection online, online that's available to our public that has you know thousands of images, um, oral histories, um, lots of great stuff from our local community and beyond. Um, and I also got to select audiobooks and ebooks for OverDrive when I was in that department. And I worked on all the public desks at our large downtown library and regularly staffed our phone bank, um, which at the time was our Hillsborough County information line because, like I said, we're part of the county. So we were actually taking calls for other county departments like animal services and um, taking code enforcement complaints and um, got a lot of interesting stories from that. Um, and in this last year, I've moved to my third department in three and a half years, and I'm in learning experiences. And my role here in learning experiences is business and innovation services specialist. And in this position, I help support our county economic development initiatives, and I'm the liaison with our um, Entrepreneur Collaborative Center, which is our small business information center. Um, and I help to develop and support partnerships to promote libraries as co-working spaces for startups and budding entrepreneurs. And I promote the library's collections, our print and um, digital business resources, and uh, provide training and information about new technology. Um, we have some new collaborative technology called Mediascapes from Steelcase um, that allow people to plug in and work together as a group. And so I've, I've worked on um, making those more 
user friendly for our staff and for customers and helping to market those um, as part of as part of framing the libraries as co-working spaces and um, and then as part of my job I'm doing a lot more outreach and learning more about what the business community has to offer and what they're looking for so that I can help develop our business resources. Thank you very much Laura. So let's hear from Susan a different perspective on the library work and her career. Well good morning everyone. I've been working in libraries uh, for over 25 years actually. I started my library career at age 15. I started working in technical services and I've continued working in the field um, as I earned my college degree. For the past eight years, I've been employed as a manager for the Citrus County Library System. Uh, I oversee two learning service areas, adult literacy education and early literacy. I work with the youth team. Pretty much everything about our library is about learning and advancing education to people of all ages. We've always offered computer skills classes, but approximately seven years ago, the library system started providing adult literacy education services. I was instrumental in getting these services integrated into our library system. By adult literacy services, I'm talking about helping adults with basic reading and writing, pre-GED skills, English language learning, citizenship studies, life skills, employability skills, including interviewing. Because we are a smaller to medium-sized library system and we have experienced budget cuts in the past several years, we do rely heavily on trained volunteers to help us to provide these educational services. Volunteers either hold one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions in our five branches or we do hold several group classes uh, and events throughout the year. We've trained over 300 volunteer adult literacy tutors and instructors and 31 volunteer teams to be our Reading Pals. Our Reading Pals is a youth um, services initiative where we actually train teenagers to read to youngsters in the library. It's really a win-win situation. Uh, we have seen teens come to us, um, you know, with lacking self-confidence. And after their two-hour literacy training and after their reading to the little ones, they just totally blossom and it's really a win-win situation. Their own reading skills improve. Okay. Thank you so much, Susan. And I think both of you have been talking about this, but how have your responsibilities changed over the years? And Susan, maybe we'll go back to you since you have a longer career with the, with the library community. Okay. Uh, I've really been required to become knowledgeable in adult literacy concepts, uh, English language acquisition, GED test content, and measuring skill levels of adult learners through assessment. I mean, everybody knows these aren't things that you learn in library school. Um, I have become a pro-literacy national certified trainer in adult basic education and in the ESOL literacy. I just want to make a point that all library jobs nowadays require technical knowledge and skills. Staff really know how to trouble, need to know how to troubleshoot computers, printers, software applications, knowledge of ebooks and downloadables. We really need to be device experts nowadays. Staff have to know about social services and which agency would be the best referral for the person inquiring about the information. I've really seen a change in youth librarians. Some of our youth librarians are certified educators. And youth librarians nowadays are expected to be early literacy experts, early childhood specialists, not just storytellers. They're expected to know about Lexiles and accelerated reading lists. Youth librarians are also a huge resource to parents. Um, they, they're, we're serving more and more children with sensory issues and disabilities, especially Asperger's and autism. And we're learning how to work with these special needs kids in story times and programs. You know, we've learned to tailor the story time, you know, having them a little shorter, adding more graphics, more songs, and an occasional break or two. Uh, youth librarians are definitely participating in broader outreach events, as all staff are. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about outreach a little later. We're doing a lot of the STEM programming, you know, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We're doing Legos and Wii gaming, um, Team Tech Week. We're participating in all those wonderful things. With QR code, scavenger hunt contest, and stop motion using Windows Movie Maker. 
And uh, let's hear it, Laura, from you. Uh, you have a little bit more of an outsider perspective, even though you've worked in a lot of the parts of the library down in Tampa. What's your observation, especially of the staff around you and how they're having to evolve? Yes, um, I actually did a, like a little informal survey of some staff who have been here longer than I have just to to get that more of that perspective. I know in my short time here, you heard you know all the different things that I've worked on just in three and a half years. So I know people who have been here longer have been through a lot of change too. Um, some of the feedback I got was that they're um, that even though um, librarians have always adapted to change well, the pace of change has changed has quickened in the last few years. So um, just the techno the advancing technologies, especially having to learn all these new um, e-readers and how to you know put overdrive on your different um, devices and um, all our different databases that we now offer and um, so and all our different services that we offer. So it's important uh, to learn all those new um, services that we have and tools, um, but it's also, they're saying that it's, it's really important to be adaptable and to know it's okay to change right away when something comes along and just be prepared for it. Um, so, but yeah, I, as far as my own skills, you heard I, I, I didn't do HTML when I was in school. That's something I learned when I was here and I learned enough that I was able to work on our internal blog, our internal website and our external website. Um, that was new to me and um, has introduced me to other people and books and resources that I never would have explored otherwise. So I think um, a lot of people are learning to go deeper into their individual jobs and really dive in and um, learn, learn more about what their specific job area is and seek out new training related to that. Okay, thanks Laura. So let's go on to our next question about the structure of the library. Describe any new staffing structures. Um, I know whenever a good while back I got out and uh, worked out in libraries that we would have a separate outreach department and our outreach department did the books by mail, bookmobile, we actually did the literacy program too. Um, is, is that still the model or are there other models? Is it blended? Can you sort of describe how looking outward um, is happening at Tampa? Sure. Um, we don't have a specific outreach person. We have, um, we are, I think staff are increasingly expected to do outreach within their own areas at all levels. We have, for example, I'm working in business and innovation services. I don't have an MBA. I don't have a background in business. I, I have to rely on outreach to learn more about my community that I'm serving in the business area and I have to talk to people and bring in experts to talk about different subjects that are going to help our customers. Um, so that's really important in my job, and everyone's kind of doing that at their own different levels. I know Youth Services reaches out to the schools a lot, and they do outreach in the schools and go do story times out at Head Start and things like that. Um, we partner; I, um, they've partnered with the local muse the Children's Museum, um, so they're doing it within their own scope. And everyone, I think, is kind of increasingly expected to do that because we have to make. Um, the public more aware that we're here and we're still a vital part of the community and um, learning more directly from our community is, is makes, makes us a lot more credible than us trying to just uh, learn everything ourselves and spit it back out. It's a lot easier to bring in the experts and um, let them do the teaching of, of the more advanced things. Oh, Susan, what about Citrus County? I've definitely seen a change in this philosophy over the years. Um, Citrus County does have a communications facilitator, but regarding outreach, we do use a mix of staff. We send the best person for the outreach, the one who's most knowledgeable in the content area. Um, we did repurpose some positions um, recently. We do have a literacy services librarian now, and that position was repurposed um, from reference librarian. And just to be able to meet the growing needs of the adult basic education programs that we offer, we just needed this new position. Another um, repurposed position, which is wonderful, is the library project coordinator. We needed support to the managers and the supervisors, especially with policies and procedures, and keeping track of special library projects from across all five branches. We did lose some staff. Um, we did 
at one time we had an assistant library director, and now we just have one library director and two managers for the five branches. And the library project coordinator really helped uh, keep us on track. It was funny because our new services were causing changes faster than our policies and procedures were getting updated. And this person really helped you know, admin staff to, to bring it all back into alignment. Another um, change that we've made to staffing has been adding volunteer coordinator responsibilities to our customer service specialist position. Um, Volunteer coordinators really recruit, hire, train, manage, and direct work of volunteers in all of our branches. Um, for a county of 140,000 in population, last year we relied so heavily on volunteers that they provided over 24,000 hours of service. Of course, we've changed the reference librarian title, as many others have done, uh, to instruction and research librarian just to focus on the educational component that we are, you know, focusing on in our libraries nowadays. And lots of staff are involved in programming across the board. We're teaching adult crafts classes. We have experienced the public feeling the need to create that maker space type of thing. So we're, we're reaching out and offering what's, you know, being asked of us. Um, and they're doing really creative things. You know, some staff have different talents and we, we go where the talents lie. Thank you very much, Susan. So in this whole context, how have you gotten the training, the education uh, to make this shift? How is it, what's been happening? Uh, what professional development opportunities uh, have you taken advantage of? So whoever wants to start first. Uh, well, I, we, per, uh, we have a lot of great free trainings that are available to us, uh, like Florida Library webinars. We have um, TVLC offers great trainings on a regular basis, um, a lot of them web-based, some of them in person. Um, we use our vendors who provide our databases. A lot of them will provide training, um, and not only for staff, they, they've offered to do training for customers too, so um, that's really nice to have. Um, and we also sometimes have the opportunity to go to things that are um, not free, like um, like conferences or, um, for example, FLA is a great resource. Um, but even beyond that, I know um, I have a colleague who works in archives, and she went to a, a fantastic conference out in Portland, and she was able to learn all about um, digital archives at that conference. I attended a conference in Atlanta that was about um, turning outward. It was through the Harwood Institute and uh, with a partnership with ALA, and that was an awesome training. But, um, but the local ones are good, too. Um, we went to a, um, in Hernando County, there was a great training where they brought in a library director from Columbia, South Carolina, uh, Melanie Huggins. She came and spoke about customer service and how they rebranded their library. Um, so there's a lot of great trainings and resources available. And um, our own staff are great resources, too. We have staff, um, I know Susan mentioned, um, staff are teaching their strengths, and we have that too at our library. We have um, some staff who just recently started teaching sewing classes because that's their passion, and um, so they, they are experts in that area, and they're able to provide those skills um, not only to customers but to help train other staff as well. And we have a question. Uh, yes, Deborah Riley writes, does anyone do outreach to senior centers or retirement communities? Well, Citrus County has partnered with senior centers in the past. Uh, for example, we've actually had them bus in for special hands-on computer classes. One of our libraries is actually based in the same building as a, a retirement um, or adult, our aging services department, and so they are able to do some partnership things there. And I, and I know individual libraries have done uh, partnerships with their local seniors as well. And that's the whole topic for our next uh, session. Of course, uh, for the old librarian. I just was going to mention we do the homebound delivery as well. Mm, okay. That's citrus, right? Yes. Um, moving on. We just heard from Jean Capola about the importance of forming partnerships with other educational agencies. Who do you partner with and why? How do you choose your partners? 
Uh, for us, uh, partners are largely based on by project. Um, we, we want the people who are right for the job, so it just depends on what that job is at the time. Um, but we have, uh, for, for myself, I, I, we partner with uh, the Hillsborough County Economic Development Department and the Entrepreneur Collaborative Center. So we work to sh um, schedule, they schedule workshops in our libraries, um, and they offer us a lot of great resources and um, connections to other people within the field. Um, we partner with individuals in the community. We've had several great grassroots programs start up from community suggestions and people who want to um, start programs in the community, and so we were able to support that. Um, we partner with our local museums. We just started offering um, checkout of museum passes. We call it a discovery pass, so people can check out a family pass to local museums. Um, we partner with the schools. Um, and each one of these partnerships, even though, um, like I said, is by project, we you know, it's not a one and done. It's a lot of times because we've made that contact, we are able to partner with them again in the future for other things. So, like for example, the museums, we started out with them with the museum pass, but we've been able to do other things. Like um, they paired up with our uh, the children's museum as, that was part of that project uh, has paired up with our youth services department, and they've. Um, offer, they actually brought over displays from the Children's Museum and placed them on our children's floor that are nice interactive displays that our customers can um, interact with. And then um, they've also allowed our youth services specialists to come over to the Children's Museum and offer programs to help get more exposure and tell people about what's going on in the library. So, um, and that was, you know, an unintended consequence of the original partnership, but it was a great opportunity that, that came from that. Um, we also have um, we have a lot of schools, or a lot of agencies that are close by. We have a, the University of Tampa, and we've had um, individual uh, ind individual teachers who are working on specific projects contact the library for more involvement. Like a history professor was bringing over his class to our history department, and his class actually has a project um, created. Um, they did a lot of research that is actually going to be used for one of our brand new libraries that's opening. Um, the, the Robert Saunders Library is going to have a um, African American Research Center in it, and so they actually did some research on a historical part of town, um, and that research is going to be used in the new museum as part of the displays. So a lot of great, um, a lot of great local connections. Okay, uh, Susan, what about Citrus County? County? Our library director Eric Head has been on our local education foundation, and he's actually currently the president. We've always had a partnership with the schools, but Eric's involvement on the Education Foundation. He is really getting to know the people and who the decision makers are in the school. It's an excellent partnership. And they have allowed us to use their facilities, even a uh, large auditorium for summer youth programs. We also go into the schools and we do the kindergarten sign up for the library card sign up month and uh, many other literacy events. Some of the other partnerships that Citrus County gets involved in is the University of Florida Extension's office. They offer amazing programs in plant knowledge, you know, cooking and growing herbs, and financial literacy. They've also done several financial literacy programs in our library. Um, U.S. Department of Homeland Security in Tampa will come out to your library and do wonderful presentations on naturalization and citizenship. We also partner with a local immigration lawyer. Um, this way, he can answer questions uh, to people wanting to become citizens, uh, becoming naturalized. And we don't have to get involved in the, the legal aspects of that. The Daughters of the American Revolution and the Sons of the American Revolution come out and do wonderful programs with us on uh, Flag Day on June 14th and Constitution Day on September 17th. We partner with AARP for the driving school and the tax aid, uh, the Sheriff's Department and the Department of Corrections. We also partner with our local uh, courthouse museum. And we partner with uh, three homeless um, shelters where we actually send in volunteer tutors to provide on-site assessment and instruction. Uh, Susan, I'm curious, what would the Department of Corrections? I'm sorry, Sandy. Did you say Department of Corrections? Yes, we partner with the Department of Corrections. Um, so this way, we, we actually meet with them, we go to their meetings, and this way we can help the released prisoners re-enter society and work on their literacy skills. And we're hoping to give them a, a successful new start. Interesting. We do have a comment. Um, 
we've got someone that said, we have partnerships with the Pembroke Pines Ch Chatter High School where our computer lab is used MLS on a daily basis. We have computer classes on Tuesday night in Spanish, and on Saturday night we have the English computer classes. And where was that? Um, Pembroke. Pembroke. Okay. Interesting. Speaking of partnerships, what about the whole area of applying for grants together or securing donations? What does the partnerships mean in that in that arena? Okay, um, this is Susan from Citrus County. Well, our number one means of support, of course, is our friends groups. We have a very strong uh, Friends of the Library group. Uh, they give us funding, support, advocacy, and we really appreciate them. The Florida Literacy Coalition is a wonderful resource. If you've never been to their website, please do so. They have funded us over 20 times, and you know they have health literacy grants. They have you know, citizenship grants have all kinds of little grants for you to get a program started in your library. Uh, we were successful in getting an LSTA grant for laptops for our tutors and learners in adult literacy. Of VALF, the Volunteers for Adult Literacy in Florida, we currently have a $500 a grant from them. Uh, the Dollar General and the American Library Association have gotten their literacy grant. And um, Pro Literacy is another wonderful organization, proliteracy.org. We currently have a National Book Fund grant. Um, and we do go out and do outreach and speak to different clubs and ask for support. Uh, Rotary, um, Altrusa, women's clubs are really passionate and supportive. Um, but sometimes working with these groups, sometimes it's more important than just getting money. We really want to build a relationship with them so that they will be our biggest supporters. Laura, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I've, Susan said a lot of the things that we do too, and um, the grants. Uh, I, like for an example, we, I mentioned we had we got a StoryCorps grant. We definitely reached out to community agencies to help us as we applied for that grant because when you have other agencies as partners, that really lends credibility to your grant application. So when we were applying for this grant, we had. Um, local radio station WUSF helped us out um, by providing us letters of support. And we had a couple other agencies too. Um, our local genealogical society, our African American genealogical society uh, paired up with us because our, our focus for our grant in collecting oral histories was um, local, Af local African American history. And so they were a great partner. Um, but not only did they help us, uh, like Susan said, it's, not, it's about building that relationship. and. Um, it wasn't just about getting the grant. They actually helped us once we had the grant to help connect with people to bring them in and get them to come and um, tell their stories. Um, and, and we have an ongoing great relationship with them. We have lots of volunteers that are here regularly in the library doing other things from that group. Um, and so it's great, like she said, to just, ma just to maintain those relationships and reach out because it, it kind of validates that group and tells them that you think they're important and, um, and they, they see you as being more important because of that. And I'll um, join in. Uh, we did Florida Libraries as Community Memory uh, November and December, and we did have one of our discussions there on oral history. And it was a really rich uh, discussion, uh, talking more about Tampa's uh, StoryCorps project and Jacksonville StoryCorps project. So it is a recording that's up on that's up on our Florida that you can go to through our webpage. So moving on to this, the skills and knowledge that staff need and those out there responsible for doing that. You've talked some about this already, but folks out there are the multi-type library cooperatives, the Florida Library Association, library schools, national library associations, and, um, and education-focused coalitions like you heard from Susan, the, the Florida Literacy Coalition. You know, how have they been helping meet your needs um, and what more might you need to help your staff evolve as you look forward with your planning? I think they've offered a lot of great um, trainings. Um, we have a, I, 
um, we have a person who puts together upcoming trainings that are available for our staff and he sends it out as like a calendar uh, listing so that staff can see what's coming up and kind of fit in the things that are relevant to them and fit into their schedule. And so it's nice to be able to, to do, have that flexibility and people can see what's coming up. Um, but the, the specific trainings, I, I found um, the ones that offer opportunities to talk with other people are really helpful um, or to network with other libraries who are doing similar things. Um, I had reached out to Hernando County when they were doing their, their they did um, a similar project, video histories, and I talked to um, staff there about their project and how they were doing it, and it was nice for us both to be able to bounce ideas off of each other. and. Um, and some of, the, some of the best trainings are the ones that allow you to connect with other people that are doing that. And also, I really like trainings that um, bring together people who are not local, who are from out of state or across the country. Um, when we got to hear from that library director from South Carolina, that was really great, just uh, to hear totally different setup for a library and um, how they were viewing things there and what was driving their decisions um, was really interesting. So I think. The, just uh, the, the ones that allow those outside perspectives to help you think about things in a different way are really helpful. And I'm going to jump in and, and share. County oh, located, I'm sorry, Sandy. Go ahead. I was going to say with Citrus, with Citrus County being one and a half hours north of Tampa, you know, we do use the Tampa Bay Library Consortium, but we have to do a lot of internal staff training and coaching and mentoring. And I was going to share, uh, Outside the Lines is an initiative that actually came out of the Colorado. And it's an initiative where for one week in September, they had 180 libraries last fall who did sort of unique and different things. Uh, if it was a small library, then the library just on every corner they had somebody reading all during that week. Uh, another library actually showed the film Labyrinth and then built a labyrinth. What I'm circling around the saying, one of the things that they found after when they did the evaluation is that they wanted to have sister libraries. So exactly what uh, Laura was talking about and what we all do, we just don't, may not do it as formally. So just wanted to throw out that idea, the concept of having sister libraries. Mm -hmm. We've got a question. We participated in that outside the lines and it was really interesting. Um, we did it through our social media and it was with a hashtag that was used for that event. Mm -hmm. and it was really neat to click on the hashtag and see what everyone was posting and the, the unique things that every library was doing. So if you have the chance, I would definitely look up that hashtag for Outside the Lines and check that stuff out. Cool. And we do have a comment. Um, someone said we also offer citizenship classes, Zinio, Freegal, 3D printer classes, iPad classes, etc. We try to reach out to our customers' needs. If they're interested in something that they need, we'll provide the right person and the information. That's great. We do a lot of that um, here too. We have the, and that's something that our staff, as far as talking about training and um, training needs for staff, all that new equipment, the 3D printers, it's it's a new world for us and um, our staff and they've had to learn um, that, that new equipment and the new software. Um, we use Tinkercad here for 3D printers, but we also, we have a new maker space. We have new tools that are in there, hand tools. We have a recording studio that we've had to learn about um, how to set that up. And um, one of the tools we used was our own database, uh, lynda.com, um, has some great training and we used, um, I know our staff used uh, training on there to help set up our recording studio. And that's what, it's also something that's available to our customers. So if we don't have the expertise in exactly what they're looking for, um, lynda.com is a great place to refer them to to get more. Again, if anyone out there has a question or a comment, please put it into chat. Uh, to ask our uh, presenters this morning. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask uh, maybe Susan first and Laura second. What recommendations would you suggest to help staff as they take over moving into a stronger educational role? What have you learned from your mistakes and your successes? Well, I think you should make education uh, the element, you know, making educational elements to be the culture of your library. You know, we strive to be everyone's learning place. And library staff are educators now more than ever. And we do need to be constantly learning and growing and be flexible. Uh, you know, 
as our roles change and to learn fast along with the changes and stepping outside of your comfort, comfort zone. Um, I like to use myself as, as an example. Uh, seven years ago, I didn't know much about adult literacy. And now I'm almost considered an expert in the state of Florida. And it really all depends how much time you're willing to put into learning something. And pro-literacy, I'm going to mention Florida Literacy Coalition again and pro-literacy because they have really helped me to hone my train the trainer and presentation and platform skills. So look outside traditional library webinars for your furthering continuing education. Thank you, Susan. Yes, I agree with what Susan just said. Um, yeah, I was I, when she was saying that, I just realized that last week I discovered our local nonprofit leadership center offers great trainings, and it's um, I I picked out a bunch of classes to send to my supervisor, and I put in um, ones that I thought our friends of the library might even want to um, to be to attend. Um, so there's there's all kinds of sources out there. Um, just have to look for them, but yeah, they don't have to come from a library source to be relevant to your job. Everything is relevant to libraries these days. <laughs> um, but as far as um, our, you know, what would we suggest to help staff as they're moving into a stronger educational role? Uh, definitely ask for training. Um, there's so much, so much training out there that's available for free. Um, there are community resources. You know, reach out to your community. Ask for help with things. Um, you've got a large community with a lot of experts there, and all you have to do is ask them. Um, I recently started an entrepreneurship program for kids. Like I said, I don't have a business background, so I reached out to my to the startup community that I've started to get to know by attending events, and I ended up having more mentors sign up than I had kids signed up. Um, so they're there, they're interested, they love to give back to the community. The library is a trusted source for information, and, and they love to say that they're partnering with us. Um, so just ask. Um, definitely dive into your job. Jobs change all the time, so just focus on what you're doing now and focus on how you can do it the best that you can and really get to know it. Um, customer service has always been big in libraries, but it's especially big now because libraries are not the only place people can go to for information. You know, you can search the internet. That wasn't the case um, a long time ago. They, the library was kind of the keeper of the information, and that's not the case anymore, so we really have to um, show people our, our great services and our customer service and our value to keep them coming back. Um, a lot of the shift has been to bring um, higher level staff, uh, the, the staff that have MLSs are being pulled. Um, in our library system, we're seeing a trend of pulling higher level staff more off the desk so that they can work more on supervisory and management and design type um, projects. And um, so it's important for um, staff to have that supervisor and management training. So if you didn't get that in library school, which a lot of us didn't, um, that's something to look into and to promote. Um, uh, you know, eventually everyone should should be a supervisor at some point. You know, that should be a goal because you want to become the expert and help other people um, do the best that they can. So I, I encourage supervisor training, even um, even if they aren't even thinking about it yet, just to just to know how that works. Um, even if you're not a supervisor, it helps you understand the supervisory role better. Um, and the last thing, I, I'm taking this from notes from um, when I did that informal poll with our staff. Um, they also said, you know, some of the some of the planning that you might not, or some of the training that you might not have gotten in library school, um, budgeting, um, strategic planning, marketing, a lot of that, and tr being the trainer instead of um, just finding training, but being the trainer. So being more in that educational role, um, not only for customers, but for your staff. Um, so those are all things to look for trainings to become better at to help you in your jobs. This is Patrick. We have a comment from Isabel. Isabel writes, we are planning an outreach to the local elderly nutrition dining site to give a program on how to use SafeLink phones. We also plan to do a basic computer class there soon. Thank you, Isabel. We've that's got a great example of going to where people are. Um, that's that's another thing with the community outreach. It's just really important. Um, don't expect people to come to the library. You may have a great training planned, but if the people might not necessarily come to the library for it. So think about who your audience is, where they hang out, and take it to them. We've got another comment. Um, someone said, I think it's more important that staff be trained or prepared on all kinds of devices, from the librarian one to all the supervisors all kinds of resources that relates to the job. Everyone is different, has different levels of, levels of knowledge. We should all be in the same level. 
most important is the upfront librarians that are very much that are very hard to adapt to new devices, changes, and focus the library needs and technology. Uh, this is Susan from Citrus. I'd like to add a comment. That's excellent. That's an excellent point, and I'm, gra I'm glad you brought that up. Something that we do in Citrus County is we actually rotate a group of e-reader devices around to all of the branches for hands-on learning just for the frontline staff so that they feel confident. Uh, you know, it's a great training tool. Thank you. We're about to wrap up. We have like a couple of minutes if anybody else wants to make a comment or ask a question of Susan and Laura. There's lots of good uh, resources being posted into chat, so I encourage you to take a look at the chat screen there to find resources. If we don't have anything more, we'll go ahead and wrap up this session and give you a break. And we'll see those of you who can stay for our next session on services to see with seniors and technology. Um, and this is Melissa. Just don't disconnect your computer. If you're going to stay on, you can stay on all throughout the day um, until we, we end at 4. Um, just you know, you can stay on right through. If you do have to leave, that's fine. You can use that same link to get back in again. Um, if you have more than one person at a computer, if you could let us know for our stats. If you've already let us know, that's fine. But um, we're trying to keep track for our stats of how many of you there are. And we think it's wonderful when you do uh, watch it together. That way you can have conversations about the content and whatnot. But, um, but we like to know about it. So um, we will um, be right back at... Um, at noon for the seniors in technology. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Milas. I'm the continuing education consultant here at the Bureau of Library Development. I'm so glad to see so many folks joining us today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our library administration consultant, Sandy Newell, who will be facilitating our session. Sandy. Thank you very much, Patrick. Welcome, everyone, to our third session of Florida Libraries as People's University. If you have not introduced yourself, please go ahead, introduce yourself in chat, provide your name, your library location, and job title. And if you're doing anything with the uh, seniors at this point, Add that in, too, so we get some context here. This session is going to introduce you to strategies in working with seniors with a focus on a specific program that is uh, implemented in um, um, Pasco County. Now, according to our strategic plan, uh, many of you probably know we have to do a, a, a plan for our Library Services and Technology Act. And according to our plan, we know that Florida has more than 70% seniors compared to 13% nationally. And we know that many of you who are in some of our uh, southern counties have a much larger population. I believe like Charlotte uh, is one that has a very large population, which you don't think. Uh, and this percentage doesn't count our snowbirds who come down every, uh, every winter. Today you're going to hear from two people who are experienced in serving seniors. You see on your screen on the left is Kathy Mayo. She's a freelance consultant who retired from the Lee County Library System. Uh, and in November, for our Florida Libraries as Community Memory, she actually provided a webinar on using reminiscing programs with seniors, which is recorded on our YouTube site, so I'd encourage you to go and, and take a look at it. And there's a lot of handouts, too, that she put together for that session. Kathy has a long history of speaking at state and national venues. She will be joined, is joined, uh, I guess we're in the afternoon now, <laughs> she'll be talking <laughs> by Isabel Featherstone, who is manager of the New River Branch Library, a branch of the Casco system. And she started the program there that uses teens as technology tutors for seniors. So we're going to start our session with Kathy, to be followed by Isabel. Actually, they'll be tag teaming a little bit back and forth. Again, while they're talking, please introduce yourself in chat. 
uh, and um, include information about you and maybe anything if you're working with seniors. So I'll go ahead and give our uh, floor over to Kathy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, next slide. Today's topic is one that might have seemed strange a decade or so ago, yet today we know that everyone is impacted by technology and older people are coming to libraries for help in understanding and using all types of devices and equipment. In this 50 minutes, we'll discuss seniors and some of the many ways that libraries can respond to those requests for information and assistance in using this technology. Serving older adults is okay. Back up one slide. Thanks. Serving older adults is nothing new for Florida libraries. While much of the rest of the country is finally paying attention to this growing presence, we've known seniors as a significant user group for decades. Where I live in Lee County, 25% of the population is over age 65, and that doesn't include the large number of seasonal residents who spend months here every year. Counties like Charlotte and Pinellas have over a third of their residents in this age group, and age-restricted communities for people age 55 and older are now fairly common throughout the state. We're living longer and we're healthier. Um, we're getting better medical care, and we generally have a much better understanding of preventive care than the generations before us. Certainly in our lifetimes, we've seen both the perception and the reality of healthy aging. Next. Lifelong learning. Gosh, long active lives are a good thing, but it's also a little confusing, especially for institutions like libraries that take that concept of lifelong learning to heart. Libraries are in a position to offer seniors something that few other institutions are providing intellectual stimulation, community centers for all ages, and the chance to broaden their knowledge on a myriad of topics, including technology. Libraries are trusted and familiar with a long track record of proven ability. We've seen that lifelong learning opportunities don't have to stop when you retire. In fact, they become more important than ever when people have the luxury of more time. Next. So who are these people we call seniors, older adults, or elders? They generally fall into three groups, frail elders, active seniors, and baby boomers. Today we're going to focus on the last two, active seniors and baby boomers, and describe some of the characteristics that might suggest how the library can serve them best. These are the older adults who we can most effectively reach with technology information and training. Next. Active senior, seniors, like my neighbor Billy, are generally in their 70s and 80s. They live in their own homes or apartments or in a senior community of some sort. Almost all active seniors are retired, at least from their primary careers, although some tend to work part-time. Many of them volunteer for organizations like your library, where they find social outlets as well as other rewards. Their health is generally pretty good, with few limitations on activities. It's certainly better than past generations. Billy here, at 88, is older than many others in this group. She's in pretty good health and has a positive outlook on life. Next. Active seniors participate in community life. For example, they follow politics, attend religious services and concerts, visit libraries, and drive or use public transportation. Like any group, they represent a wide range of economic situations. They receive Social Security, and many also have pensions. Remember that this group grew up in the Depression, and they learned to be conservative with their money. Active seniors are usually empty nesters. They value relationships with grandchildren and great-grandchildren, even when they live some, some distance from each other. And this is one of the reasons why they are interested in technology. They want to understand those grandchildren and keep in touch through social media and email. Active seniors are often regular library customers. They also attend programs and they volunteer. 
Billy here still drives, often with her five dogs that visit chiropractors and vets. She uses a computer and a cell phone, but doesn't spend much time with either. When my husband told her that we had a dining table that needed refinishing, she took on the project herself and did a beautiful job. That self-reliance is a real characteristic of active seniors. Next. Baby boomers are now ages 51 through 69. Like Cheryl here, we live in our own homes and apartments, some in 55 plus communities. Most of us are still working or planning for retirement. Some have scaled back careers and are working longer than we originally planned on. And the oldest of us, like me, are often volunteering. Our health is generally very good. We're quite health conscious and we generally plan to live forever. Cheryl is in her late 50s and has an important job with the agency she works for. She's definitely thinking about retirement. Next. Baby boomers are active in the community on many levels. We're still organizing and running clubs and staying quite busy um, in our neighborhoods. Our economic situation varies. The recession hit some of us very hard and many people are, are postponing their retirement. The oldest of us have started to receive Social Security. Technology is an important part of our lives. We weren't born with computers, but we've learned as adults, usually through our jobs. We don't pick up every trend in social media, but we use the technology that works for us. Many of us are part of the sandwich generation, still helping out children while caring for parents and spouses. Many of us are grandparents. Boomers are rediscovering libraries for themselves. They used public libraries with their children and are now seeing new values in this institution. Cheryl does community outreach, so is deeply involved with her community and church. And she uses technology in many ways. Next. Here are some basics for serving these seniors. Listen to the voices of seniors in all aspects of the planning, implementation, and evaluation of these services. Seek out their opinions and suggestions. Um, use the tools that work for all customers. Advisory and focus groups, surveys, community forums, and just plain one-on-one -on -one conversations. Explore your local resources. It rarely makes sense to provide services without involving other agencies, organizations, and businesses that also serve this group of individuals. Discover where you have common goals and partner to deliver services. I love um, the earlier presentation by Susan and Laura. They listed so many great partners for us, um, and, and that's something that's important. Make service to seniors a staff responsibility. Identify specific staff members to handle services for older adults and include it in their job descriptions and performance objectives. Get them the training they need to work well with seniors and encourage their networking with community partners. Next. Seniors are ready, willing, and able to tackle all new technology. They're eager to get basic information through advanced instruction on all aspects of using computers, smartphones, digital photography, the internet, ebook readers, and social media. They tend to focus on a few areas geared to their specific interests, such as downloading music or using Facebook. If you get a chance, go to YouTube and look up Webcam 101 for Seniors. This is, um, it's a funny short piece, but it gives you a good idea of how seniors look at technology. We're all a little afraid of breaking something, but we're also eager to learn. Next. So, you ready? Next screen. Where do you start? First, get input from your seniors. What are they asking for? This is where you ask staff to share the remarks they are hearing from older customers. The next step might be a focus group or a survey. Assess what is available in your community. Some training is often available through senior centers, adult education programs, 
residential communities, AARP groups, local businesses, and wellness sites. What level of expertise is already available? Next, decide what role the library can play. Is there a gap in training offered in the community, or is there a need for more offerings? Consider what part of the training pie the library could tackle. Next, some other considerations are deciding on whether to be a, a solo operation or a cooperative venture. Usually it makes sense to partner with other agencies and organizations in this regard. Initially, the library might want to be a site for an existing training program, for example, with AARP or the local YMCA. Do you have the internal resources to handle this? Do you have staff or volunteers who can offer the appropriate training? What about your space, your equipment, devices? What types of training can you offer? Some libraries focus on the basics, while others specialize in a specific type of training or offer a range of opportunities. It all pretty much depends on what your community needs and what you can offer. Next. Isabel's going to take over from here. Hi. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about technology adoption by older adults, then technology benefits and challenges for for older adults, and finally the Teen Technology Tutor Program that I have at my branch. Next slide, please. Today's webinars highlight lifelong learning at your library, and for many older adults, digital, digital literacy is an important skill that they lack. Older adults age 55 plus did not have the opportunity to learn about computers and and the internet in school. There has been a great increase in computer use by older adults, but there is still a great digital divide for them. So where are we now? Well, uh, in the year 2000, there were approximately 14 percent of older adults uh, using the internet, and it has climbed now uh, to 59 percent in 2013. This is from a Pew Research Center report, Older Adults and Technology Use, which came out in April 2014. Next slide, please. Now, 77 percent of seniors own a cell phone, but only 18 percent of them own a smartphone. Many of them tell me that even the ones who have a smartphone, that uh, they just use it to make phone calls and they don't know how to use the other parts of it. So that's an opportunity for us to, to help people to learn technology right there. We've also seen a great increase in the number of older adults who own a tablet or an e-reader or both. It's up to 27 percent of older adults have uh, one or the other or both of these devices. One interesting thing about tablets though is that many older adults call all tablets iPads. So you have to be careful when you're talking to people and asking them you know, what they need help with. They'll say, uh, I need help with my iPad, when actually they might have a Samsung Galaxy Tab or a Nexus or uh, one of the other tablets. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, there are several factors that we see in technology adoption. Uh, technology adoption tends to decrease with age. For 65 to 69 year olds, approximately 74 percent go online, but by the time you get to 75 to 79, only 47 percent go online. This is also from the Pew study. Technology adoption also increases with education level. Uh, only 39% uh, go online if they have a household income of less than $30,000. But when you, by the time you get up to uh, $75,000 a year, on 90% of those older adults go online uh, with household income. And also education, the more educated, as you would expect, the more they would go online. Okay, uh, benefits for older adults. Of course, uh, 
being able to use the internet opens up the ability to go to online government services, Social Security and Medicare are online. Um, there's a great push to have uh, all of the fi filing for the taxes online, as we all have seen since this year they're not giving us any of the tax booklets. So it's a real benefit when people can go online uh, to do the government services. Medical information that people can trust through Medline Plus. Also job search tools and job skills for people that may be in their 50s or 60s who um, need to continue working. Uh, a lot of people don't even know that Employ Florida has the Silver Edition part of its website which helps people in the 50 plus demographic to get uh, online career resources. Also, uh, what they found from research is that once seniors go online, it becomes a regular part of their lives, and 71% of them go on to go online every day, and 11% three to five times a week. 79% of older uh, adults who are online believe that people without the internet are at a real disadvantage. Next slide, please. So I've talked about what we usually think of as the benefits for going online, but there's an additional benefit for older adults, and that is the social support that they can get through social networking sites and interactions online. Currently, one quarter of seniors um, use online social networks. 41% do not go online at all and 32% go online but do not do any of the social networking. <clears throat> they have found that um, the older adults who use social networking sites socialize more frequently than non-users and have more persistent connections with people they care about. So the results are consistent with the, the hypothesis that lower reported social support is an um, important reason for decreases in life, satis life satisfaction and increases in depressive symptoms. So when they can go online, they can get social support, it tends to decrease depression, reduce risk of physical disease and mental illness, and increase quality of life. Next slide, please. So we're going to face challenges um, for helping older adults going online. First of all, many older adults are not convinced about the benefits of technology use. 35% of non-users feel that they are not missing out on information because they don't go on the internet. Next, uh, technophobia. Uh, they're afraid, first of all, that they will hit the wrong key and break the computer. They're also afraid that they won't be able to learn. And Along with this, only 18% feel confident about learning computers on their own, and 77% would like to have someone walk them through the process. Now, physical challenges that they will face include things like um, lower vision, uh, arthritis, uh, palsy, things like that, which will affect how they can interact with the computer. And finally, lack of access to training, especially for people who are low income or may not be able to travel far from where they live. Uh, being able to get training is a uh, big barrier for older adults. Next slide. So I have taught computer classes in public libraries for about 10 years. In my current system, I have taught beginning computer skills in classes with about nine students. It worked, but individual students had lots of questions and not everyone in the class had the same amount of computer experience. In addition, seniors like to retake classes over and over to absorb more information and to feel more comfortable with the technology. However, we did not have enough staff to provide a lot of one-hour, one-on-one tech training sessions. One summer, I was trying to create volunteer opportunities for teens looking for Bright Futures scholarship volunteer hours. 
I realized that we did not have any computer classes during our summer reading program and that a lot of people had to wait months to get into a computer class. So I had a light bulb moment. I would set up a program to teach teens to tutor older adults in basic computer skills. Next slide, please. I know what you're thinking. Can you trust the teens? Do they have patience? A lot of people have seen that it doesn't necessarily work well for when family members try to teach their parents or grandparents, so they assume that that is a problem with teens in general. But what was really going on is that when you try to teach somebody within your own family, there are some psychological differences going on and barriers which don't happen when you're teaching a stranger. Teens do have a lot of patience with strangers. They know this is a job, they take it seriously, and they do have patience. The teens will rise to the occasion and do an excellent job. They will surprise you. Next slide, please. I'm going to tell you a couple stories about uh, the program. First of all, I wanted to talk about uh, one day I had a, an older adult woman who came in and uh, she could see where the teen was waiting for her and I saw the look of apprehension on her face. I could see she was nervous because she had not been around teenagers in a long time. Any time that she had seen any news on TV about teenagers, they were always negative reports about criminals and crime and gangs. This. Uh, teen volunteer was also of a different race than her, which is an added uh, stress for people of that uh, age group. A lot of them uh, grew up in times when um, there was not as good a relationship between races. So you could see that she looked a little nervous. But when I brought her over and introduced her to the teen, Within five minutes, they were laughing and joking together as if they'd known each other their whole life. It was as if something magical had happened. Next slide, please. Okay, actually, uh, back one more. Okay. So, <clears throat> Another thing that happened is that uh, I had teenagers who would come to me and thank me for this program because they really loved it. I have had teens tell me that they didn't realize they could be teachers like this. One of them said that she was actually considering becoming a teacher as a result of this experience. I have had uh, the seniors come and tell me how much they enjoyed the program. They also do a great deal of complimenting for the teens. They really enjoy the instruction and they tell the teen about it. So as a result, the teenager is getting positive reinforcement and compliments about a job well done. Many times in kids' lives nowadays, they're given false praise. Uh, everybody is given the same praise whether they do a good job or not, and, and so there's a tendency to ignore praise. But this is so well deserved that it tended to make the, my teens more self-confident. Some of them became a, a little bit more outgoing. And they definitely enjoyed the whole program. And usually, they would recruit all their friends to come and be, be a part of the program. Next slide, please. Another thing that happened um, was that there was a positive relationship forming between the teens and the seniors. Uh, one of my um, teenagers told me that he was really going to miss the couple he was tutoring when they went back up north since they were snowbirds. He felt that they had become like adoptive grandparents to, to him. So what I found was that in addition to having what I expected to happen, which was teens get their volunteer hours and seniors get to learn basic computer skills in a less stressful environment, what happened was even the better than that, which was uh, social interaction and uh, really a good time for both groups. Next slide, please. 
I also had uh, one teenager who was completely bilingual and she was able to help a segment of our population which none of our staff members could, which was an even better benefit too. Next slide. Okay, so the benefits of the program for seniors. They didn't have to wait a month to get into a class. They found that learning com computers was less stressful with one-on-one -on -one help. They had social interaction, and they also had positive interaction with teens. Teens were no longer those scary uh, people they saw on TV. Next slide. The benefits of the program for the teens, they got lots of volunteer hours. Especially over the summer, I had a whole a lot of teens working throughout the summer, and so they were able to get a lot of their uh, Bright Futures hours. <clears throat> they uh, got positive praise for a good job and self-confidence. They found they could make a real difference in somebody's life. A lot of the volunteer opportunities for teens are sort of make work or paperwork or something where they don't really see that what they're doing is making a difference in the world. Um, and this type of situation where you can take somebody in a few hours from not being able to use a computer to being able to do internet and email and contact family members throughout the world, they can actually see the difference they, they can make in somebody's life. And finally, the teaching and tutoring experience that they can now put down on their resume for when they want to get part-time jobs in college or, um, or full-time jobs after at least they'll have something that they can put on their resume, which is nice. Next slide. Okay, benefits for librarians. I know that's what you guys are thinking. What's in it for me? <laughs> well, um, older adults can be taught computers. Less staff time is required. It helps local teens. And it's also great for recruiting teens into your teen advisory board and other teen programs. I don't think uh, that I can think of a better return on investment than this program. I'll talk to you in a minute about you know, how I do it. And I, you have a one hour training that I give to the teens. And uh, that one hour training for a particular teen can result in 75 to 100 hours or more of tutoring for older adults, and you can't imagine a better, greater return on investment than that. Next slide, please. Okay, so how did I do it? Well, the, I used a teen training PowerPoint. This PowerPoint stresses that the teen needs to be a personal trainer and cheerleader for the senior. This is really key, because the main thing is to convince them that they can learn, it's going to do one thing at a time. They will have a handout that they can use. They'll go over it as much as they need to. They'll uh, answer all their questions. And that anyone can learn. And that it's normal to start out not knowing anything. Even the teenagers had to learn it at some point. And by getting this across to the senior, it makes it a whole lot easier for the senior to learn because that stress and fear is gone. The second part of the PowerPoint goes over the psychological obstacles for seniors, talking about things like how they're afraid to, to break the computer and uh, things like that. And then finally, I go over a section about physical challenges, such as arthritis, palsy, uh, low vision, things that um, the teen can help them with. Uh, how to do things like use a right click and then a left click to open something for somebody who can't double click, um, helping people to uh, use a trackpad instead of a mouse if their hand shakes too bad, things like that. Next slide, please. The program was for seniors age 50 plus. I went with that because I didn't want anybody younger working with the teens because I didn't, you know, want to have a situation where you had a, you know, uh, a man in his 30s or 40s using this as an excuse to sit with teenage girls. Uh, 
you can uh, change it as you want. If you wanted the age to be 55 and above, you know, you can always modify that. I found that I like to use teens in grades 9 through 12 because they were old enough and uh, mature enough to handle the tutoring. You still have to uh, interview your teens to see who would work well with this program and who wouldn't. If they're too quiet or if they can't speak up or if they have a strong accent, they may not be ideal for this program and you might want to have them do something else like Teen Advisory Board or other opportunities for volunteering at your branch. Teens have to promise to be at the library for a set two-hour period, one day a week for at least a few months. So that way you get your return on the investment. Next slide, please. I recruited teens by contacting National Honor Society sponsors and guidance counselors. Teens get credit for the hours if they are present, even if they don't have an appointment that day. That's important because um, that way um, they're not sitting there and not getting uh, credit for it. it as long as they're there, they're available for walk-ins and they get credit. So if they don't have a, an appointment, they can work on homework. Next slide, please. Okay, now Kathy is going to talk about um, what Florida libraries are offering. Well, we recently asked Florida libraries about the technology training that they were offering for for seniors, and we discovered that the programs varied widely. Some small libraries were doing more than large systems. It all depended on their local needs. Um, these are some of the examples of things we saw. Um, tech boot camps for mobile devices. Um, this is where you get seniors to bring in their device. Often the, the thing they got as a gift um, over the holidays or, or for a birthday or something, bring it in and then they can work with a teen or, an, or a volunteer or a staff member um, to learn the basics of how to use that piece of equipment. Um, computer instruction is pretty common um, throughout Florida, basic through advanced, and every library seems to do it a little differently, but um, I, I was amazed at how many libraries are, are offering um, this kind of instruction. Um, I saw courses on using smartphones and tablets, and you know you can do a whole course on just bringing in your smartphone and using it with a group. Um, there were also separate courses just on internet basics, um, including finding and selecting apps. Next slide. Uh, several libraries are offering classes on preventing computer fraud, and they're often doing it with the local sheriff's department or other law enforcement agency, uh, finding the right products for you. And sometimes these are done by having um, a local computer company bring in lots of products to demonstrate. Um, using e-books and downloads, this is a real natural for libraries. Um, guarding your tech legacy. Now this is something I'm just starting to see and it's basically to help people for to plan for if if they die what's going to happen to their all their tech accounts and and all that information that they have and there's there's actually help out there. Um, exploring social media whether it's um, Twitter or Instagram or, or Facebook. This is really important and we heard Isabel say that um, being a part of social media seems to have a really positive impact on people. Using digital photography, well this is something we've all, probably all been offering for quite a while but now people want to do it more with their smartphone and they want to know you know how do you, where do you store all that information and how do you organize it and how do you share it. So it offers up whole new topics for people. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Isabel has something that, um, that some of us can do that would be really nice. And she has a senior blog. And maybe she can tell you about her senior blog. Hi, everyone. I have a, a blog for seniors uh, that I write for Pasco County Library Services. It's the Pasco County Library Services Seniors Blog. And um, with this particular uh, blog, I talk about 
uh, what's happening at the library system, upcoming library events, but I go far beyond that. I like to do things like give them uh, information that I get from news articles uh, and also from things like uh, government agencies which have something going on for seniors. I also do local events for seniors, whether there's a senior fest or uh, other senior gathering in the area. I do things like I uh, post things for the local area agency on aging. I post great volunteer opportunities in the area for seniors. And I also do inspirational articles such as ones about senior athletes in their 90s who are running or doing athletic, other athletics. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things that you can write about to, to, uh, to your seniors in your community. And I just posted the, the link to that on the chat. OK, okay. next. So I've got uh, a list here of uh, the resources, uh, the Teen Technology Tutors Training PowerPoint. Uh, in addition to the PowerPoint, I always provide handouts to my teens so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. All they have to do is go step by step through the handouts that we use for our regular computer classes. I have uh, in a uh, handout that we will be sending along or making available online to the state. Uh, there will be links to some of those actual handouts, including handouts for tablets that might be helpful to people so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Also, I recommend engaging volunteers as tech trainers in public libraries, a webinar by Squee Lay and, or Lee and Randall Smathers. They used uh, either college interns, Ms. Lee used that, and Randall Smathers used adult volunteers as tech trainers, and they have some good information there. Also, Carol Bean's website has a lot of information uh, on helping seniors learn technology, specifically dealing with the physical challenges. Yeah, we have a four-page handout that we put together, and um, it's got lots of information for you, um, and maybe Sandy can tell us how they can get it. And next slide. Okay, it's your turn. What questions do you have? What do you want to know more about, or what can you tell us? So we can go ahead and um, ask questions in, uh, in chat. And um, while well, we've got Kathy and uh, Isabel in our virtual room, we are working on getting the handout that Kathy talked about earlier uh, through our communications process. And so we will have it out there. If anybody wants it individually, uh, just email me. Um, let's see, I'll put my, my email address in the chat. I don't think that we have that. Um, it's sandy.null at dos.myflorida.com, but I'll put that into chat, so if you, if you want it, I can send it to you individually. Um, but we also are working on it. Uh, I think what we might end up doing is putting some of that up on our, our web page. Great, thank you. Yeah. Questions for Kathy and Isabel, or comments about what you're doing as far as your program? Um. Here are some co library contacts for local technology training programs. This will be included on the handout as well. Somebody just did a comment, I think. So we have lots of contacts. There was uh, Desiree says she would like to see a preview of those offerings. So I guess that's a preview. Patrick, don't you love these dogs? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this has become so common today. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> yeah, they had. I run. 
Yeah, I run a discussion group for seniors, and one of the topics we've talked about is technology. And I told them that there was a new word out, and um, did they know what a selfie was? And some of them did, but most of them didn't. Didn't. So we then proceeded to take selfies of everyone, and um, they thought that was wonderful. So that certainly um, gives you an idea of the kinds of things you can include in your training. Yeah, you may not have the dogs to come in. Who knows? Aww. <laughs> Any questions, comments, sharing what you're doing related to serving uh, seniors? Put them into um, chat. I'm, I'm impressed with the, the photography classes that one of our um, volunteers offers. And he's, he just gets people walking outside the library, taking pictures, bringing them back, um, showing them how to organize all those pictures. And I'm so impressed because I don't know how to do all that. Um, and I, I think, wow, this has got to be you know, one of the most popular classes we offer. Uh, Folks have just rediscovered photography. It seems like now that they have these great uh, these great smartphones that do everything. Yeah, they, they, so much is at your fingertips now that you used to have to lug a bigger camera around uh, in the past. Um, Isabel, I'm curious what um, what are some of the most popular um, things that that the teens teach. Uh, teach seniors? What is well, it that people seem to want to know the most? Well, uh, first of all, just the basics. Starting with parts of the computer, using a mouse, um, using their email. Uh, I find a lot of people uh, get set up by family members with, say, Gmail, which uh -huh. I think is like the, the graduate school of emails. It's very difficult <laughs> for beginners. Hmm. And then the, the teens can help them na navigate that. Uh, we have uh, more and more questions now on smartphones and how to use them, and a huge amount on tablets. I haven't had the teens specifically working on tablets yet. I've been doing that mostly with staff, but I would like to, to move forward and, and have them do more with that. Uh, people tend to get completely you know, lost with the tablets, and as I say, a lot of people are skipping computers entirely, and their first internet and computer experience is with a tablet, so they still need to learn basic safety issues like avoiding scam and fraud uh, and phishing in emails, because it doesn't matter whether you're doing it through a computer or a tablet, you still need to be able to, to know what to avoid. Uh, that's pretty much the, the main things, I think. I've had uh, how to use uh, an iPad for pictures and photo, and photo editing, all sorts of things to do with tablets. Do you get many requests for people wanting to understand apps and how they work and all of that? Yes, yes. To how to download them uh, and uh, how to get around in them. Of course, we've always done downloading ebooks uh, to OverDrive and Access 360, but uh, we, are all, we can also help people with other apps. Great. We've got about another three minutes that we can stay, stay on for questions, comments. I know we had the question earlier in our previous session about who uh, visits um, um, outreach services to senior centers, not senior centers, but uh, assisted living or nursing homes. And uh, Kathy, you use volunteers uh, with one of your uh, programs on reminiscing that I mentioned at the beginning. Yes, we use a lot of volunteers. We've got 15 of them now, and we go out in teams of two. And we, we actually go to the, the residential facility or the um, adult daycare program. And, you know, earlier we were talking about um, some partners that people might not know about. One of the 
the groups that I find valuable is the local organization of activity directors. These are the people that do all the activities and, and programs in senior facilities and in a lot of counties they have separate organizations and those people love the library because um, we can do training for them and they can get um, CEUs for it and um, it's a pretty um, pretty nice partnership that we can make together. That, that's interesting that the, not in the area to have an association or a group that gets together. Do they get together monthly? Or yes. Um, oh, our, the one here, I think it's every two months they meet. Mm -hmm. Cool. But, um, the whole idea of technology, if they knew that, <laughs> that we could maybe come out and train and um, they would be delighted because most of these places have sort of token computers in their facilities for people to use, but I don't see them doing the training that they need to do. And um, this would be um, something very popular, I would imagine, in a lot of facilities. We do have a hand raised. Uh, James, go ahead with your question or comment. Well, James, if you don't have a microphone, you can go ahead and type it into chat. Um, we've got another question. How much time should be dedicated to a senior customer when they're learning a new device when you're short on staff? Uh, do you want to take that, or Kathy, or no? <laughs> I want you to. <laughs> well, generally, just in my system, if it's going to take more than five minutes, and we just have one person working at reference, um, we generally just help them for five minutes, and then say we have to get back to other people. Um, if we're having a slow period and nobody's around, we can, you know, check back and forth to help them, but. For somebody who has really never touched a computer before, we can't really sit down and help them fill out, you know, an Access Florida thing or um, unemployment or anything like that. So um, generally what we try to do is convince people who don't know how to use a computer at all to either come to one of our classes or come to this one-on-one -on -one with the teens because that way uh, usually we can get them scheduled with a, with a teen within a week or so and get them going and then they have time to actually learn stuff. Unfortunately, it seems that a lot of people want to jump ahead quickly and they really have to take it step by step or, they, or they're going to get stuck later on. We've got another question. Any bring, anybody bring in health personnel or bankers to do computer sessions on professional content? Um, health personnel, like for certifications for nursing, nursing or something? I'm not sure about the question. Let's see. And then there's a, um, another, re refine another question. Just curious about referrals to professional content, help with bankers or health questions. Uh, we don't have anything like that, though at my library we do have Shine Medicare volunteer who comes in every week on Thursdays for a two-hour period. So uh, for people who don't know how to use a computer, he can help them sign up for Medicare and pick the best plan that meets their needs, uh, their particular uh, medicines. Uh, the, uh, these volunteers are fr from the Serving Health Information Needs of Elders, and they are trained by the state of Florida over a six-month period, and they're completely unbiased. There's no ties to any insurance company, so that's one ref referral that we do. Who writes in, we have a comment from Deborah who writes, in Citrus we schedule appointments when more staff are available, and we also have a hand raised. Lemoyne, would you like to add a comment or ask a question? And you can just uh, tap that, type that into chat if you prefer as well.
And I know we are um, running into our time. So um, I think we'll maybe we can, I don't know as far as the, the last question, did we? Okay, no question. Okay, so we're going to wrap up this session. Um, thanks, Kathy and Isabel, for a very interesting session on reaching out and serving seniors. And so at the top of the hour at 1 o'clock, we'll come back. Uh, with our next session, with, which is the Adult Basic Education at Your Library session. And in the meantime, we're going to do a sound check with our presenters that we have coming on, so you'll hear that too. <laughs> Thank you all for attending. If this is the last session you'll be joining today, I'd like to encourage you to take a, a survey. We'll be uh, sending, we'll be receiving it at the very end of the Virtual Institute, at the end of the day, um, and we value your feedback. Thank you for attending. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you, Sandy, for inviting us. All right, I'm going to turn things over to Patrick. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Milas. I'm the Continuing Education Consultant here at the Bureau of Library Development. I'm so pleased that you all have joined us for the Adult Basic Education session today. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce our facilitator for the entire Virtual Institute, our Library Administration Consultant, Sandy Newell. Sandy. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm happy to be at our fourth session this afternoon on adult basic education at your library. And this might be one of my more favorite sessions because my first, uh, uh, when I first got my master's and my job was actually an adult basic education librarian out of the Northwest Regional Library System in Panama City. And you may be wondering about the term ABE. It's actually the term used by the school system for instruction for anyone who's at an eighth grade level or, or actually below that, that. And we're using it today as a broader label to describe our adult literacy programs in public libraries. We know in Florida that 2.6 million adults are 20 percent. Uh, adults who are 16 years and older lack even the most basic reading skills. And this is according to the National Center for Education Statistics. Florida's got the third lowest, worst adult literacy level of all states. Uh, we're behind California and New York. And it's no surprise that these adults actually lack a GD. In Florida, the agency that is responsible for adult education is called the Career and Adult Education part of the Florida Department of Education. And across Florida, schools and colleges actually provide ABE instruction, best serving those at the middle school and the level higher up. You'll hear from our presenters a little, uh, little bit about this in context. There are high schools in Florida where, as an adult, you can go back and get credits, and that's not true across the country. We know that 26% of our Floridians speak a language other than English at home, and many of these uh, have families have children who struggle at school. And so high, libraries have historically been a place for new immigrants to come and learn. And it's no different today. Our libraries have been providing educational programs for these adults and their families for many, many years. Every library, you know, we've all heard it. Somebody walks through the door and asks for that GED book. Uh, that's been a question that we fielded for years and years. Now, what's interesting this year, um, just in the past year and a half, the uh, GED test has changed. It's been uh, the standards for passing the test have really been raised, and it's really startling the number of adults who are not succeeding in passing the GED test. On the flip side, it's also provided on computer, and it costs $128. Now, some communities and even some libraries are providing um, scholarships or actually paying for that, but this has certainly been a huge barrier. I have the pleasure of interviewing staff who manage two noteworthy educational programs. Kate Devaney is the manager of CAL, the Center for Adult Learning in Jacksonville at the public library there. 
And Susan Mushler, some of you heard earlier, actually manages a literacy program in Citrus County. So I'm going to be interviewing them. And my first question is, um, Susan, why don't you uh, briefly describe the population in your county, how many library outlets, and when did your program start, your literacy program start, and if any other unique characteristics? Okay, Sandy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Citrus County Library System is located about one and a half hours north of Tampa. And our population is about 140,000. We have five library branches. And in November of 2008, we really saw the need to beef up adult literacy education services in our five branches. So we started uh, an official literacy program. And some of our unique characteristics about what we do, because we are a small to medium-sized public library system, we just don't always have the staffing or the funding. So we are extremely volunteer driven. And I think um, we're a good example of how to run additional educational services uh, using volunteers. We, basically, we provide three things. We provide the meeting place in our library, the training, we train our volunteers extensively, and the material. But it's the volunteers that actually provide all of the actual education to our library patrons. And just to give you a few numbers, in 2014, we had 119 volunteer instructors uh, that met in five branches. Thanks, uh, Susan. Now let's go north of Citrus to Jacksonville to Katie. Okay. Hey. Well, good afternoon. Um, we are up here in Duval County, and we're a little bit larger. We have about 870,000 um, people living with us here, and we have 21 branches altogether in our system. And the Center for Adult Learning started um, about 30 years ago, and because we have 20% of the adults in Duval County reading at a sixth grader below, and so we started a computers and Literacy was the original name for Cal, and it, it evolved into Center for Adult Learning. And we also do um, English second language classes along with um, the literacy classes. But today, I'm probably going to just, most of what you'll hear about is our adult basic education program. And we, um, we do have paid staff, and we'll get into that a little bit, about how that works for us. But we do also use volunteers for some of our classes in the branches outside. Um, our center is located at the main library downtown in Jacksonville, so that's where most of our adult basic education classes are held. And that's a little little tidbit on us. <laughs> the next question I've got here is, is, what is the library's budget overall? And do you have a separate budget for the uh, literacy program? And what's the source of your funding? And I'm going to go with Susan, and then we'll go to Katie again. Okay. Well, in Citrus County, our library budget total is three million. There is no dedicated literacy budget, so we really have learned how to provide these services on a shoestring. Um, our funding comes from local partnerships and grants. Uh, we have gotten the LSTA uh, grant before for adult literacy to purchase laptops for our tutors and learners to use. We were the recipient of the American Dreams grant with ALA and Dollar General. Um, currently, we have the VALS, V-A-L-S grant, which stands for Volunteers for Adult Literacy in Florida. And pro-literacy, um, we have a national book fund grant um, that we just received. Florida Literacy Coalition has sponsored us over 20 times. Um, wonderful, wonderful resource, the Florida Literacy Coalition. Um, and we also go out and do um, speaking to um, different organizations in the community, such as Rotary or Kiwanis. Our women's clubs have been wonderful, wonderful supporters. Um, the Daughters of the American Revolution, Altrusa. These are some of the people that we continue to partner with um, so that they build support for our adult literacy education program. And, you know, we make this known to the community stakeholders and local officials as well. Thank you. Let's go okay. to the next and 
up here in Duval. <laughs> okay. um, in Jacksonville, we are a little bit larger, so the library's budget is actually $36 million, and Cal, we um, have about 59000 and that comes just from the general fund in the sense of paying for some of our staff here um, in the Center for Adult Learning, because we, um, we do not have to rely on the librarians to teach. We have our own staff here. And then um, we also have been the recipient, recipient many years of the LSTA grant, although last year we did not have it, but we have it again this year. Um, we rely on a lot of in-kind donations, too, going out and speaking to everyone um, to bring in the budget. But where we are now with a specific um, budget for us, I'd say kind of came about five years ago when the Jacksonville Better Plan came into effect, and they actually, in some of the newer libraries, gave us designated classrooms and stuff. So we were able um, to grow the program from where it began to, to where it is now and actually have the backing and the funding built into the library's budget. So we know we're very lucky to have that. But it has um, enabled us to have a program where we serve on the average between 800 and 900 students a year, um, individual students a year. So it's been really nice. OK, thank you. And we'll stay with Jacksonville. And my question mm -hmm. is, uh, is back to, would you describe some of your adult basic education services provided by your library? Uh, the target audience, partners, et cetera. Okay. Well, we have, as I said, we have kind of two programs. We do adult basic education and ESR, two main here with us. Um, for our adult basic education program, we actually partner with Learn to Read of Jacksonville. Um, they now are housed with us here. And so we're lucky enough because they, our target is anyone 18 and older and at the moment, we have narrowed it down to re working with adults reading between the third and sixth grade level. You know, we're using, we use the tape for our um, intake. Having learned to read as our partner is really helping us a lot because they start at zero and they go to six. And um, our new direction, which will be starting um, this year and going forward, is we're actually going to move to the sixth through ninth grade and since we have this strong partnership and learn to read would be 0 to 6, and then we will be 6 to 9. So right now, though, we deal with adults 18 and older reading between the 3rd and 6th grade level. Um, we do have some that stay with us and, you know, are working on GED um, prep at the moment. Um, we also, because of our ESL program, we have a lot of students that's also an 18 and older. It's an adult program that kind of segue. They come to us or their language skills are too low to go right into the adult basic education side. So you have to work with them on the English language, language side, get their language skills up enough then to be placed into a class with the adult basic education. Um, and so we have a lot of that, that transfer over, which is kind of nice, and it's a little bit different. Um, because a lot of the times you're just dealing with someone who has the education level but doesn't have the vocabulary or just just hasn't been immersed enough to know enough about the culture and the way we use the language. Um, and we use computer-based programming for adult basic education. We have a computer lab that holds 16, has 16 computers in it. And so someone could be working on either an uh, internet-based program or a standalone disk program. And then we do small group instruction also. And off of the LSTA grant um, a few years back, the old manager, Sharon Jeskula, created a program called Fast Track, which is a phonics-based program for adults. And it, it's about a 12-week program, figuring if we only had our adults here for 12 weeks, could we at least give them the foundation they need um, for syllable division and sounds and whatnot. So that's kind of the services that we're doing right now in Jacksonville. Thank you. It's good as interest. Some of the services that we provide in Citrus County include basic reading and writing, uh, pre-GED classes in multiple subject areas, uh, studying to pass the naturalization exam or citizenship classes, and English language learning. We also impart uh, life skills and workplace skills. Um, we held interviewing experience courses as well. We do target adults that have the lowest of literacy levels. Usually they are coming to us and they are reading between the kindergarten through fourth grade level. For the um, basic reading and writing, uh, most of our volunteer tutors, 
They use the Lit Start, which is an excellent resource put out by Michigan Literacy Council and available for purchase from New Readers Press. It's basically our uh, tutor training Bible, so to speak. Um, we do have a lot of partnerships for adult literacy. Um, I think I mentioned the Florida Literacy Coalition. I cannot mention them enough. They've funded us over 20 times. Uh, the Pro Literacy is another organization that's wonderful. Uh, a lot of online coursework that you can even take for free uh, to get yourself more knowledgeable about uh, adult basic education. Okay. So my next question is around sort of why does the library provide these services? And then what difference does it make? You know, what's the, um, what's the outcomes? What's the impact? And how do you collect that information? Either one who wants to go jump in? I'll grab well, first. In, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Well, in Citrus County, um, we definitely saw the need. Um, one out of every four people is functionally illiterate in Citrus County, and approximately 21,000 residents do not hold a high school diploma. Also, we wanted to promote, we promote the pursuit of knowledge and deliver quality information. That is our, one of our core missions, is to advance education. And, you know, some of the things that we do, we do, we do have quite a bit of homeless people in Citrus County with the economic downturn. We do partner with three homeless organizations where we actually have volunteer tutors go on site to assess adult learners and teach learners just to get them those literacy skills to get them employed. All right. Okay. And, um, yeah, it's, a, it's funny. It's the same thing. We were um, saying that you know, the library here, we're providing all this free and unfettered access to information for all the individuals in Jacksonville, but we have so many who couldn't even come in and, and enjoy using the services that we have because of um, their, their reading level and, and where they are. So they, we knew it was a need to have the classes here. Um, we do, um, when we, we bring them in, because at the end of the day, we, we track not only um, the quantitative, like, you know, okay, are they moving up a grade level or whatnot, but we, we get the goals from each student, whether it's they're in a job and they need to, you know, they, they're looking for a promotion or they're looking for a job because unemployment, as we all know, and an application nowadays is a seven-page process, unfortunately, even if you just want to be the bagger at, a, you know, thinking a simple job. Um, so we, we track what their goals are, you know, is it that they needed, um, a job? Do they need a promotion at their job? Um, are they in a job and now all of a sudden they have to take a test at that job? So we get a lot of that. They're coming to us um, saying, I'm in a job and, and they've decided now to test us at the job. So we do both ways of tracking because we, when we go out and ask for funding, that's the, the feel-good story. The funders don't understand always the grade level. You're trying to explain to them somebody moving up a grade level or they, they think somebody's going to jump in six months from you know, reading at a fourth grade to a sixth grade, and, and it doesn't happen like that. But it's better to be able to say, we will able at least, along with helping them while they're working on their reading skills, to help them on those life skills to maybe get a better position at work or to get a new job or to, for the first time, go in and speak to the, their child's teacher without having somebody else go for them, you know. So we do, we track both here, um, keep both sets of um, data on file, so we know where the students are, whether they're moving um, with a personal goal or with an academic goal. And um, we do, um, everything we do do though is in the library, because our goal is to bring patrons into the Broad Library and to be here for the library patrons. So we will go out and maybe train at another location if a local organization calls us, but they don't want, we won't go out and actually teach for them. We'll train their um, the people at that organization, if they want to have it housed there, we'll go out and give them a training and we'll teach them either on our fast track or whatever um, they want help with. Um, and then, but our goal at the end of the day is we keep all of our classes at the libraries to bring them in as a patron and, and to have the free services with us. And jumping in and tying our last session to this session, 
the uh, Collier County Library Literacy Coordinator, Roberta Rice, actually would do something similar, go out into the uh, nursing homes, assisted living uh, facilities, and what she would do is actually train the, the people living there in how to tutor the adults, especially I think it was non-English speakers down there. So they actually, uh, the people living there had the skills and would tutor the workers employed at the assisted living facility. So which I thought was really a nice crossover about uh, impact and how to spread a program. It's nice because you're also taking the, you're taking a resource from the library, so the, the person who works at the library, and taking them out and, and giving that information um, to, to that company or, you know, that, that place of business or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, hopefully it's, it's growing the goodwill of the library and making people understand, too, how important we are still to the community at the end of the day, you know. So my next question is about how your program has evolved over the years. So like Jacksonville and Katie, we'll go with mm -hmm. you because you have the, the longest, um, <laughs> the, the oldest program of the two represented here. Yes. Well, we definitely have evolved. I, I have not been with the program since the beginning. Um, but as I said, when they first started, they only had 10 computers. Um, we did... Um, small group, which we still do, and a little one-to-one, -one. Um, and we were using some very, I guess, old, old software that was, um, I, my understanding, it's a little bit of a phonics space. I, I don't know what they used 30 years ago. Um, and as I said, over the years, the nice thing is, five years ago when they did the greater, I'm sorry, 10 years ago when they did the greater Jacksonville plan, and we were given designated spots in the different um, libraries. Here at the main library, they, they created a beautiful computer lab for us. So we now have 16 um, computers. So to, to get you all to understand how important the computer aspect is, is that we can have one instructor who has 16 individuals. If they're all doing, if they're all at a different level and all doing something different, they can still be in one room um, getting the benefit because the instructor does go over and spend time with them, um, is monitoring all their work, able to pull them out then and put them into a small group um, when, when they see what the needs are for them. Um, and it also gives that individual who's an adult who does not want to be in a group and, and, and just wants to be on their own, hey, that's fine. You've got your computer. You're working on your program here. Um, that's no problem. And then we were also, because of lucky enough to have the space and our libraries, um, even the libraries we do not have designated classrooms in, are willing to give us a space because that's the hardest thing. You need a space that, you know, twice a week you want that space for an hour and a half so that you can have your class in there. Um, but we grew to having just one room with the 10 computers and trying to do it all there to we actually have classrooms in the different libraries now and um, the different libraries who do not have a classroom set up for us are willing to give us one of the study rooms or something, you know, twice a week for an hour and a half so that we can hold the small group sessions um, in those classes. And we've grown from just having standalone computer-based, you know, they have to have a disk, put it in the computer, to through funding being able to have the online um, computer programs that a student can come and they can also be a distant learner because these are adults with jobs and so maybe they can only come once a week or you know, we've had some really good students who, unfortunately, because of their job, they can't come during the hours the library's open. So we're able to say, no problem. You can work on it from home on your computer, and the instructor can be monitoring that and then just have conversations with them or meet up with them once a month and say, hey, you know, here's how you're doing, this, that, you know, and work with them on whatever their issues are. And that's, I think, kind of the biggest thing of how we've grown. Uh, Susan, citrus. Yes, our library system has always placed a high importance on computer classes and in, you know, technological um, course offerings. What I think is what's evolved is that our library director has now made adult literacy a priority. It's actually a core service area right up there with the technology courses. So that's a really good thing. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've added new services for learners. For example, about two years ago, we started offering the pre-GED class offerings. And, you know, it was trial and error, but we found out that we can pretty much always offer a math foundational class, and it will always be filled. 
Uh, some of the other courses, we have started doing the just-in-time when we actually get five or six learners for that particular topic, then we hold that type of class, so we've learned with that. We've also expanded our tutor training. Um, most literacy programs or adult basic education programs have some kind of a new tutor training. And we have expanded that to offer four different specialized types of training. We now have a new tutor training, a pre-GED instructor training, a citizenship instructor training, and a training workshop just on assessment. We've also added additional assessments to capture learner gains, some of which our literacy services librarian and I have actually created in-house. Um, and that is another great thing that has happened to our literacy program is that six months ago, um, our library director saw the importance and we did hire a literacy services librarian. Okay. What we'd like to hear now is some of the things that are most effective, and you've been sharing that, but also it would be good to hear what are some things that you tried that di didn't really work well, it didn't turn out. It's, it's always good to hear from, from both. So, Katie, go ahead. Um, well, I think, yes, as, well, as you said, I've already said the thing that worked really well for us is I think the computers have been a, was a big success here in Cal. And I will tell you, when you grow, um, as we've grown, being able to get the funding to have a few paid instructors, because we use volunteers also, and I think, but there is some, there's a good side to both. Um, having the paid instructor for the ABE classes in that um, consistency um, year after year in the lab really makes a difference, I think, for us in keeping some of those students um, coming back and staying with us as long as they need to stay with us to get to the level that they need to go. Um, what hasn't worked as well, I think, you know, we've just had a little bit of since I've been here, it's all been successes, and I've been trying to find out in the past what they struggled with, with you know, trying to, to make it work. And I think the biggest thing that, that didn't work well was either trying to do too much at once, um, you know, really finding the niche of what we wanted to work on. And, and as I said, it's funny because even for um, the Center for Adult Learning, we used to do eighth down to zero, and then I think we just kept honing in on what we could do, and at the time, Learn to Read, it's our partner here doing the zero to six. They've been um, teaching even longer. They've been 45 years in Jacksonville. So we kind of realized, hey, there's a, there's somebody out there that um, we need to be focused on, you know, maybe a little bit smaller um, span. It's not a smaller group because obviously we've grown in numbers. But we were able to say, okay, here's the group that we can help that third to sixth grade reader who has no place else to go. Um, yes, you could go learn to read, but learn to read was giving that service for that that zero to six. So I think that was one thing: is don't have too wide of a span, narrow it down, because um, that seemed like that was not working for us. We were trying to do too much at one point, serve everyone. So. Uh, Citrus Kelly. In Citrus County, we definitely are a success story in running a quality uh, literacy program on a shoestring. Uh, the other thing that I think we do exceptionally well with is advocacy and community awareness through outreach and public speaking. Um, often, we'll take an adult learner with us on a speaking engagement. Uh, about a year and a half ago, there was actually some talk about closing one of our libraries in Crystal River. And we actually brought an adult learner to the commissioners to share his personal success story. He actually was very touching. He explained how he had been incarcerated and that he was going down the wrong path. But he saw the library advertisement for holding pre-GED classes, and he enrolled. Well, to make a long story short, eventually he did get his GED, um, and he did enroll in college even. And he attributes his turnaround to the library system. Another thing I think we do um, exceptionally well in Citrus is once we educate our volunteer tutors, we support them. We have 
quarterly continuing education meetings with various topics, and we often get input from them what they want to uh, learn more about. What we, what we struggle with, okay, we struggle with capturing all of the statistics. Uh, we do have a database, um, a proprietary software called Matrix, um, and we, it's the staff's amount of time. Um, we do have a literacy services librarian now, but you could probably spend all day long every day in that database, and it would take years to, um, you know, be able to get it all worked out. So those are some of our struggles. The other thing is sometimes you can offer classes, and it may not be well received for one reason or another. You know, don't get discouraged. Um, we learn sometimes you have to offer just-in-time classes based on you know, what the actual needs are. Sometimes we'll get a class of five adult learners that want to take science, and then we'll hold the science class. Okay. Um, so what tips would you share with other public libraries considering starting a literacy program today or partnering closely with existing literacy programs, whether they're the volunteer literacy programs, the school system, um, there's sometimes churches, nonprofits out there doing that. So what tips if we have folks here in our virtual room thinking about, hmm, um, I'd like to start something? Well, I think, just like you said, it's if you say, hmm, I think I want to start something in my county or my area, would be looking to see who has some programs going on and, and start right away with making them your partners. because. Again, if you can figure out what, what services you really want to concentrate on and maybe see what's out there, where is there a little gap? Where, where, you know, where is there a need that maybe somebody isn't helping, you know, um, whether it be um, like the pre-GED or, um, and the, you know, part of the problem is there's a lot of paid for programs out there and our, most of our students, you know, can't afford that. So that is a, is a given. But I think it's neat to, if you research in your area, okay, who's already got something, find out what, what style and what kind of program are they offering. Um, and then the other weird thing is you kind of need to find out what works time-wise, because I don't know if Susan's group found, in, found this, but we have really found there are certain days and certain times in our libraries that no matter what class we offer, no matter how hard we try, we cannot get a, a group. We can just can't get students to come. Like one or two might sign up and then they never make it. And there's just certain pockets of hours that don't work in certain areas. And I think that's a big thing because, you, you know, especially when you're working with a volunteer, you feel bad, they're coming, and, you know, they're like one student shows and then they're not showing after that. And, and we really have figured out that there are just certain hours where we could not hold a class because it didn't matter what, who the teacher was, what the class was, the attendance wasn't happening. So it's, it's, you kind of do a little demographic of your, of your area then, too, as far as times, you know, that kind of demographics. Like, well, when are people here? You know, what's the gate count like during certain hours? Thank you. Susan, what about your... I agree with what Katie said. Definitely research what adult literacy, you know, education opportunities are already existing in your community because you don't want to duplicate, and this will allow you to partner better. Um, our local technical college, they do refer people to us, and we refer people to them. But often, we'll get the same learners because in our program, we can give them the one-on-one. -on -one. We can do more of the hand-holding and more of the confidence building because we have that one-on-one -on -one structure. Okay. Did you wrap up, Susan? We had some background yeah. noise just then. Okay. Um, what resources um, do you recommend to others interested in adult basic, ed adult basic education? Uh, software, online resources? We've heard a, a pretty good amount about the Literacy Coalition, Florida Literacy Coalition and pro-literacy, but what's, what's out there that have you found useful? Well, I think definitely those guys are you know, great resources to go to. You can, you know, if, if you get the funding, you know, obviously, unfortunately, this is where money comes into play, but um, 
for example, like if you are working with, you know, we have um, FSCJR College right down the street from us. So the students who are trying to get in a program there and they're giving them the TAVE test and then they're not, you know, they have to be above a sixth grade to actually enter. So, and then they're sending them down the road to us. So we use um, the ITTS, which is instruction for TAVE, um, and it's a online program. Yes, it was, it's a very expensive one, I will admit, um, but that's one of the examples of one where you have to have a one-time, put it all out there, like $14,000 licensing fee, but they have gotten a lot better um, through, you know, the McGraw-Hills or the New Reader's Press or different, you know, um, vendors where they've got these end-to-end -end licenses. So, for example, as we're going to travel into the GED realm, hopefully, um, the end of this year and going forward, we've just gotten an end-to-end -end license. So we only pay, um, it, it's just a pittance, as they would say, compared to what we paid for the ITTS because we don't have to pay a one-time licensing fee. It's all wrapped up in the seats that you own. And so it's, it's really nice if you can get that because that is something that somebody can use at your library and then when they leave you, they can continue to use it um, when the days are not with you. In Citrus County, we are really working hard to have a core collection of excellent literacy materials in all five branches. Um, and if anybody wants more information on this, we'd certainly be welcome to share and mentor anybody wanting to add some of these services in their libraries. Um, but we use a, a, a multi, you know, a multiple resources. You know, a lot of them are from New Readers Press, which is an excellent mm -hmm. website, New Readers Press. Um, you know, for example, for our math foundational classes, we found that Breakthrough to Math is just the best resource. It's very simplistic. The tutors enjoy um, using it to teach. Just a wonderful resource. Um, and if I can, uh, you know, I know Sandy had mentioned Roberta Rice. I just want to say Roberta Rice was actually Citrus County Library System's mentor in getting started in adult literacy. Um, so I'm willing to repay the favor back if anybody needs uh, any advice on adult literacy and, and getting these services started in your library. And, and can I, I'm not sure if you do this, Susan, in your library, and I hope it's okay to say, but we, the uh -huh. other thing too is I know the books are a big cost, and you know, obviously our patrons come and it's a free service. Um, and for me, it was new when I started here, and I thought, oh, well, that's smart. But the books we use in class, they're non-consumable. So we have a series of books. They're using them in the classroom when we're doing the small group instruction. They can't write in that book. You know, they can't, unfortunately, we don't even let them take the books home usually because we have to make sure we're always going to have them here and we have a lot of transient students. But um, if there is homework or if there's additional work, it's, it's cheaper than to either get the little workbooks that accompany those, like the little paper ones, or just to, you know, the instructor will create their own sheet with questions and answers, type it up and, and make a copy if they want to give something out. But we, we really keep the books as non-consumable in the sense that we can use them class after class after class after class. So if you're trying to start out, and yes, it's a big expense to buy, you know, 25 books or something for a class, but if you're a small group, you're going to have 10 students maybe, so maybe only buying 10 books and a teacher's edition, you, you just don't, you know, the students never take the books home, so we always have control over them, but we're using them in the classroom, so they're getting the benefit of it. We just, in that way, we only had to buy it one time, you know, we, and that we might be just same, given um, everywhere. For the most part, uh, we don't allow the workbooks and so forth to be written in. Mm -hmm. um, we do use a lot of tutor-created um, handouts and worksheets. Also, if we've used a plastic sheet, like an overhead projection clear plastic sheet, where you can write on with a, a dry erase marker. Um, but we do allow the learners to take the materials home. We do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I mean, when I say we allow them to take it home, we allow them to check them out. Right. They right. actually go check out the materials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the other we, thing is there are some materials that are called black line masters, um, which there's no photocopying um, mm -hmm. uh, rules, so to speak. You can make as many photocopies as you like as long as it's a black line master. I have a question for the two of you. 
Do you have your uh, ABE collection in the uh, automated, your uh, catalog? Catalog? Yes. Yes, Citrus County has a separate literacy collection. It's actually cataloged LIT. Okay, so you use LIT. We used ABE whenever we were doing it years ago. What about Jacksonville? Well, some some of the materials we use are actually up in the library, but most of it we keep. We have our own like little library here, and in our um, in our department. So um, yeah, that we just and if a student, for example, we have the um, from New Readers Press, we have a couple of the little the books and things that we buy for the adult readers. So they're adult, you know. Um, it's an adult story, but written at the at the level that needs to be written for our students, third to sixth grade. We allow those to be checked out almost like a book. We take their library card down here, and we check it out in a sense the same as a book, except for they they keep it for a full they keep it a month, and and it's just different rules for us. But we have our own collection that we monitor here in Cal. And I think that's often the case that there are the two mm -hmm. collections. One of the things I would recommend to have at least one copy of everything that's, you know, pretty good in mm -hmm. your uh, automated catalog just so that folks can know that you actually have it even though you might not have, you would not have the multiple copies because you do want to keep them for your literacy program. Right. We are at a point that we can take questions from the um, field. Uh, and as we do this, uh, I was asking sort of final words of, of wisdom uh, from each of you, but I want to get um, questions from the field who are, uh, want to know more about this topic. So while they're thinking of questions and typing in, typing it into chat, let's go back to here, Susan, uh, final words of wisdom from you, and then after you uh, with Laura. I just want to reiterate to, um, you know, again, research what's out there in your community. You don't want to duplicate adult basic education services, and rather this will allow you to partner. Um, U, uh, U.S. Extension's office does wonderful, wonderful financial literacy for us. We have the consumer science agent come in, and she teaches um, learner financial literacy concepts. She teaches tutor financial literacy concepts. So you don't want to recreate when you already have a successful partner um, right there for you. Um, the other, some of the other partnerships that we've really um, taken advantage of, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security in Tampa. Um, you know, why recreate it? They come out and they teach different courses like 101 citizenship um, and naturalization. And, you know, they actually partner with us in our Train the Trainer for the citizenship instruction instructor uh, course that we have. So I just want to reiterate, you know, see what's available out there. Um, you know, get a mentor if you're not, if you don't really know how to get started. Um, I'll provide my contact information. Be happy to share uh, any aspects of our adult literacy basic education program with you. Um, we, we've created a lot of in-house curriculum, uh, in-house tutor training agendas, um, and we wanted to share anything with you. And I think just what Susan said is exactly right. Also, just why reinvent the wheel? So, you know, she's got a great program. We've got a great program up here in Duval County. Anytime, you know, if you're, if you're close enough and you can come visit, you're welcome to visit. If you just need us to send something, because I'm a big believer in not recreating the wheel. If it's already there, you know, pick our brains, you know. Um, Ask me to jot down, you know, the ISBN numbers of all the different materials or whatever you need. It's, it's, I think that's the best way to do. Find what you think you'd like to do in your community. Find out what, where's that gap. Um, because it's always easier to start with something if it's fresh and it's new and out there. And I think the other thing is, like Susan was saying, getting out and talking about it. Because I think sometimes the people, until you sit and tell a group about your adult reader, um, and what they're going through, it's always an eye-opener to, to everyone out there. They, they really do not realize that it exists. They, they realize for our English second language students, because they think of they're coming from a country where you know education, maybe they were a woman and they would not have been educated. But 
to let them know that our native you know, speakers here are, are born and raised right here. They need help also. When you start talking about it, you'll find it how, how much they're willing to kind of help and support you. Yep. And I see we've got a question. Yes, Deborah Riley writes, um, is there good assessments, are there good assessment sites that you would recommend that are free? Well, in Citrus County, we were using the basic where to lift start assessment that actually comes with the lift start book, which is available from New Readers Press. But we found that wasn't comprehensive enough, so we created a lot of our in-house own assessments. But New Readers Press also has something called READ, R-E-A-D, and they also have an E-S-L-O-A assessment. And if you haven't seen the Dr. Fry's books are wonderful with assessment. Dr. Fry. Yeah, we use the, um, for our ESL classes, we do use the New Readers Press ESLOA. That's the assessment we use in Duval County for that. Uh, we do use the TAPE for our adult basic education classes now. Um, so, Kristen, anything free out there? Well, I mean, I mean once you, you own the resource for, for Reed or ESLOA or Dr. Fry, mm -hmm. it doesn't cost us anything. Um, you, you know, Citrus County, we are looking into possibly doing the CASAS, you know, C-A-S-A-S -S test. Mm -hmm. But if there is a cost, I think it turns out to be about $3 per learner. Mm -hmm. So right now, we are just using, you know, free assessments that we've created or, like I mentioned, the Dr. Fry, Reed, or ESLOA. And this, I'd have to look, and I, that's why, Sandy, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know if it was free, but the Slauson that we have been using for years also, which is just a word, and now, you know, it's a Slauson, it's the reading, you know, each level. It's, um, Hi. Are you? I don't know what the cost of that is when you first sign up for that or how that worked. I apologize. I can get back to you all with that and see, but that's a, um, it's a word list if you haven't heard of it and you're reading the reading, you know, the first first list is, you know, first grade, second list, second grade, you know. Um, one other thing that just comes to mind is something called Voyager out by New Readers Press, and you can actually download the assessment from their website. You don't even have to purchase the material. You can actually go to the co-literacy website and download, download the Voyager assessment. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is Melissa. There's somebody on the line on the phone that's probably not on the um, the computer part of the webinar, possibly, but we can hear you um, kind of loud and clear, so you can mute. That'd be awesome. Thanks. And I was going to give a heads up to the uh, Florida Literacy Coalition has a conference that's a great resource, and it's in April. I don't know the the dates, but it's uh, going to be in Orlando uh, again. So I'd highly recommend that. Uh, the Adult and Community Education ACE uh, Association for Adult and Community Ed happens usually in the fall. I haven't kept up with it. That's a really good place to go to see exhibits. They tend to have a pretty healthy um, uh, exhibit area. The programs themselves, again, I haven't been in a good while. Have either of y'all been? I have been, I'm going to the Florida Literacy Coalition I'm going to this year, <laughs> okay. but I, the ACE one, no. The Florida Literacy Conference is excellent. Uh, I've been going for the past seven years. Um, actually, Sharon Stegemeyer, our Literacy Services Librarian, and I are teaching two um, of the classes. Great. You can come see tantalizing uh, tutor trainings with us <laughs> or come to our Program Management Leadership Roundtable. Oh, and I did put in for a program for library literacy programs, sort of a networking discussion program uh, for, for volunteers for adult literacy in Florida. So I'll be doing that one at the conference. Okay, we are almost at 10 of, so we'll go ahead and end this 
uh, session. Thank you very much for an informative uh, presentation, Katie and Susan. And we'll be off for 10 minutes and back in for our library garden. Thanks to all of our attendees for joining us. If you won't be attending any more sessions today, please remember to complete a survey which you'll receive after the entire virtual institute is finished at the end of the day. We value your feedback. Thank you. And if you are going to stay on, we're happy about that too. Just don't disconnect your computer and we'll see you in 10 minutes. All right, I'll turn things over to Patrick. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Miles, Continuing Education Consultant here at the Bureau of Library Development. I'm so glad to see so many folks have joined our session today. Uh, I'd like to introduce now our Library Administration Consultant and Facilitator for our Virtual Institute, Sandy Newell. Sandy. Thank you very much, Patrick. I want to welcome everybody to our final Florida Libraries as People's People's University Virtual Institute uh, about building a living garden. Our final presentation is about the Library Journal's 2014 Best Small Library in America. And we're going to be hearing from staff from the Pine River Library in Colorado, and they're going to share how they expanded their services by opening their living library. I know many libraries in Florida are doing different programs and services which are food and garden connected. If you're doing anything or planning something, hey, share it in chat. We would appreciate hearing what you're doing. Um, here in Tallahassee, I know that this is happening across the state. Uh, they just opened up their seed libraries, and it's certainly getting a lot of press. We know that Newport Ritchie has a farmer's market. Uh, Pasco, I think, has just done a community garden. And the new Boca Raton Downtown Library, actually, they did not create the community garden, but it's in the same location, so they're going to tap into there. Um, I know down in Crawfordville, south of here, Wakala County is planning a children's garden, and there are cooking classes happening at Maitland Public Library. So today we're going to hear how the Pine River Library took these concepts to another level. Uh, Shelley Walchek, the director, and Judy Poe will tell their story. Uh, our sessions will end at uh, uh, 2.50, and then we will stay at on t starting back at 3. We actually have a, um, uh, give you a chance to ask more questions if we need to. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Shelly. Thank you very much, Sandy. Just double-checking to make sure that we're being heard properly. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, Thank you so much for inviting us to speak at your institute. Uh, we wanted to start our presentation off with a picture from our garden. Uh, this is part of our produce from last year, and since we've just been uh, deluged with two feet of snow, it makes us very excited uh, to look forward to the, the next couple months that are coming up when we can start to see um, our garden in bloom again. Next slide, please. So this quote from Cicero, I think, is very appropriate. If you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. Um, several people actually contacted us about this quote when we agreed to do this presentation, and uh, we already had in mind that this is exactly what our thinking was. Next slide, please. 
So this is uh, who will be speaking today. Um, Judy Poe uh, has been an employee at the Pine River Library for seven years, and she is really the driving force um, behind the garden. Um, it is through Judy's hard work and incredible organizational skills um, that we have been able to bring this garden to fruition. Judy is just about to finish up her MLS from San Jose State and uh, is, um, again, a driving force behind this. Uh, Cami Larson um, is a board member of the Pine River Garden Club, and she helped pretty much throughout every phase of the building of our garden. Uh, and I have a funny story to tell. I met Cami uh, quite a few years ago when I used to work at a local college here, and I didn't realize um, what her degree was. And so when we started to do this, um, put together our webinar, I said, Cami, what's your degree anyway? And she said, oh, it's in cellular molecular biology. So that gives you some idea of the, of the kind of folks that we have here and who are involved with our library. Um, I uh, have been the director here only for about four months. Prior to this, I was up at the uh, Colorado State Library as the senior consultant for public libraries. And I'm so excited to actually be in a library again. Um, I actually flunked retirement. I took a year off and wrote a book called 52 Rivers, A Woman's Fly Fishing Journey. But now I'm happily back in a library. Next slide. So the Pine River Library is located in the small town of Bayfield. Uh, Bayfield was actually started as a trading and social center for the farmers and ranchers of the Pine River Valley. Um, about oh, 80, years or 80 years ago, the idea for a Bayfield library was born. And this was started by members of the Bayfield Study Club who actually took a tour of a library in nearby Cortez, which was housed in the basement of a school. And so they started talking and said, why can't we have a library? And the town board took a rather dim view of, every, of anything that was considered as frivolous as a library and said, well, we need a jail more. Well, that didn't stop the women in the town from going forward with a library. And uh, they started by becoming a library district in the early 70s. And by 2004, they were able to build uh, the left half of the library that you see on the slide here, which was about 8,000 square feet. In 2010, we had already outgrown this space and uh, built an addition um, that added another 4,000 square feet. Uh, like I said, we're a small town. We're divided by a highway. Um, and we decided that we wanted to become our community's living room. Um, our vision is to connect people with uh, possibilities. And that is exactly what we have done. OK, next slide, please. So this is just a quick photo of, of our um, uh, addition process. And this area here uh, became our imagination room, which is on the next slide, please. OK, next slide. I think we skipped one. to see that you can still hear us? Yep. We just had some, some weird audio feedback. Hello, can you hear us still? Yeah, go ahead, guys. OK, great. Uh, so this is a this is the follow-up slide from um, the previous one, which shows um, our um, early childhood uh, room that 
we do lots of programming and um, uh, allows for kids to come in and just explore. Next slide, please. And the last slide is kind of our preliminary overview of what our library is all about. This is um, our first piece of um, local art, permanent art, in our library. And uh, Krista Harris um, is a uh, fantastic artist. And one of the projects that we're hoping to move forward to is cataloging all of her art in, her, in our library so that we're focusing more on developing content um, from locals. Uh, one other thing you might notice here is that we ended up as part of our um, uh, expansion changing over our nonfiction collection to BISAC. Okay, next slide please. Okay, I am now going to hand over the mic to Judy. So in 2009, uh, we did a series of programs called the Get Your Green On programs, and they were all about gardens. There were 11 classes and workshops that were developed to increase gardening skills. Um, here in Colorado, we live at about 7,000 feet above sea level. It's very dry. We get about 11 or 15 inches of rain a year, and our growing season is extremely short, maybe about 90 days. So it's very, very different from Florida. I remember days when I think we got 11 inches of rain in a couple hours when I lived in Florida. So it's very different, and everyone kept asking me if we would do some gardening programs. So we never do anything small. We didn't do a program. We did 11. Um, they included things like high-altitude gardening, vegetable gardening. Um, we did a program on small animal care, that kind of thing, and our final program was a Bayfield Farmer's Market preview. And so we had all the, the small farmers who, who show things and sell things at the Farmer's Market come in, um, I think it was a week or two before the Farmer's Market actually opened, and it was great. We had, it was almost like a party because everybody was showing what they had. Um, they even did a little bit of selling, which they weren't supposed to do, but it was impossible to stop them. And it was great. They were the best attended programs we had ever had. We had 80 people in our little tiny conference room who just wanted to know how to grow tomatoes because a lot of times what happens here is tomatoes grow, they're beautiful, and then in September they're green and it gets too cold. So we, we loved this program. Everyone had a really good time and it was the start of what we were doing. Um, it took four years. But in 2013, we broke ground for our garden. Um, oh, new slide, please. <laughs> uh, we, let's see. There was more and more community demand. There was more and more talk about wanting a garden. And it took a while to convince our board that this was something that we should do for the community. They were concerned about the budget. They were, were concerned about who would oversee the garden, who would maintain the garden, and they were really pretty reserved about the whole idea of a garden and a library. They didn't understand why we would want to have anything to do with gardening. We were about books. Um, we obviously changed their minds, and the community changed their minds. Uh, at that time, we knew that we needed help. We knew that we couldn't, as a library, take care of all of the garden ourselves, so we formed the Pine River Garden Club. We had a meeting. We asked people if they would be interested, and um, they were, obviously, and they are now our input and oversight group for the community garden. Cami is one of our board members, and um, she's going to be contributing a lot here today, too. Next slide, please. The very first thing we did this was an open lot um, beside the library. It was a really ugly field. There was nothing growing there. It was not maintained. We owned it, but we really didn't do anything with it. So we started building community garden beds. Um, we, had the, we had the site levels, and then we had a pallet of about 200 8 by 8 cedar beams delivered. And that was it. It was just an open thing, and we were kind of worried because we advertised we were about to build a community garden on a Saturday morning at 8 o'clock in the morning. It was pretty chilly, and we were shocked to find that about 30 people showed up to help us build. 
we ended up building 16 10 by 10 beds and eight 5 by 10 beds. Um, the 5 by 10 beds are higher. They're around the outside. If you look towards the back by the growing dome there, you can see two of them. They are for people who are disabled or the elderly who have a hard time bending down. So they're at they're a, between knee and, and hip level. Um, the 16 10 by 10 beds rent for $25 a year, and the eight by the eight five by ten beds rent for fifteen dollars a year. It took us about two weekends full of work. Um, I think we probably worked eight to ten hours each day, but we had families there, we had kids there, we had teens there, and everyone had a really great time. And we ended up with these beds. And I'm uh, I'm part of the Pine River Garden Club, and the Garden Club really took shape over building these beds. Uh, there were several people that wanted to have a club, but we weren't really sure how it would all uh, pan out. And all the people that just pitched in and worked their tails off building these beds, and then people would drive by and they would see it and they'd come over and they'd say, what's going on over here? Oh, I want to have a bed. I want to be part of the garden club. And it's just really taken off from there. Um, it's a great group of people. We have people that have never gardened before at all, don't even hardly know what a seed looks like. And we have people that have gardened for 30, 40 years, and everything in between, and every gardening style, and it's wonderful. Uh, in the summertime, to walk out just amongst all these beds, and you will see every gardening style that is out there. Uh, square foot gardening, uh, it is all organic. We do uh, insist upon that, but every garden style you can imagine. It's just like a, a whole room full of artistry. It's just gorgeous out there in the summertime. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that we needed to do um, in order to have this garden is have a place to keep our garden tools and um, everything that we needed to maintain the garden. So we decided to build a straw bale shed. Um, I know straw bale isn't a big building um, in Florida. You, it's really kind of tough to do such a thing. But we decided that we wanted to be as experimental as possible and teach people. And so the garden was designed not to just be built for the people, but to be built by the people. Um, <clears throat> our tool shed has an adobe floor. It has a living roof. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And the walls are actually built with straw bales. This is the frame. Um, and then what happens is straw bales are stacked between those corner posts. Um, then the other thing that, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention with this slide is all of our lumber was locally harvested lumber that is, um, we used a guy who has, he has horses and he harvests all of his lumber with horses so that he doesn't damage any of the ground. Next slide, please. So here you can see um, a wall with the straw bales already in place. And this is Emily. Emily is covering the straw with a mud plaster that's made from clay, water, and straw. Next slide. It's obviously a very, very messy process, but it's really a lot of fun. This is Eric, one of our people who was here every weekend working with us, and he's also a member of the Garden Club. And it was a really great opportunity for people who had never seen the straw bale to, to do it. And we had probably had people join the garden club because they got to come out and see this crazy thing that was being built. And then their kids got to get in the mud, and everybody was slinging mud and dragging buckets of mud and mixing up the straw in the mud. And it was, it was really a wonderful, wonderful day, even though we were so exhausted by the end of each weekend. Next slide, please. In this picture, you can see almost a finished product. This is um, a wall that's been completely mudded over. It dries slowly. You let it dry for a couple weeks, and um, the color is natural. You can also see the roof. There's an awful lot of beams up there. We have a living roof on our shed, which is something that people told us we would never be able to do in our dry, dry climate. But really, what a living roof is, there is um, potting soil and pumice up there. And it's covered with plants. And that really actually helps keep, um, keeps it cool in the summer, and it, keeps, it insulates it and keeps it warm in the winter. Next slide, please. So this is part of our crew. 
Um, as they were as they were building the walls, you can see they're sitting on the straw bales that are already in place. This was community members. It was you could see some little kids there. They got really involved and had a great time. There are garden club people there, and we even had people from out of town. The shed is in a very very prominent place near a busy intersection, and so people would just drive up, say, "What are you doing?" Didn't matter what they were wearing. They'd get involved. They'd get muddy, and they had a great time. Uh, next slide. So this is our greenhouse. At the same time that we were building the shed, we also were building a greenhouse. Um, because our growing season is so short, we didn't want the garden to only be used in, in that little bit of time over the summer. We wanted to be able to use it year round. Um, there's a local company about 40 miles down the road in Pagosa Springs called Growing Spaces Greenhouses. These are geodesic dome greenhouses after the model of Buckminster Fuller. They're manufactured in Pagosa. And what you do is buy a package, and the package is, is delivered with all of the pieces of wood cut, all of the screws, and everything that you need to put up the greenhouse is, is there. Uh, we were really lucky. We got a small grant from Growing Spaces to help us build the greenhouse. And their owner, who had just celebrated the 25-year anniversary of their company, came out of retirement to come over and lead our crew of volunteer workers to build the greenhouse. Next slide. As you can see at the top, they're putting polycarbonate panels on each of these triangles. Um, they keep the heat in. and. It was really quite fun to watch these people climb around on top of them. They seem like little flimsy plastic panels, but they're really well insulated. They have tubes in the middle that holds the, holds the heat in. And um, up on top there is the owner in his bare feet. He was like a little monkey just scrambling around on top of this thing. It was kind of crazy. Um, next slide. Oh, before you go to the next slide, you can yeah. also see in the background that the gardens are already up and growing. Um, even though the beds were only in, and the dome wasn't up, and the tool shed wasn't quite finished, and the fence wasn't up, people couldn't stand it. And they just had to get in there and get planting. And so as this was going, it was like a, an anthill with just people scurrying everywhere. We had a big crew working on the dome. We had people working on the tool shed. We had people working in the garden. The fence was going up. It was just an incredible, incredible day. And again, everyone was exhausted and full of smiles at the end of it. It was wonderful. Next slide, please. So this is what the dome looks like when it's almost enclosed. Um, the section that's missing is where the door goes. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about this? That's, a, that's one of our town board members' wives up on the ladder. She's taping all of the seams. It was really kind of nice. Um, we had town board members working on this alongside everyone else. And that's even my dog down there in the left corner. <laughs> No. I just noticed that for the first time. Next slide, please. OK, so this is a picture from the shed roof. Um, it looks like gravel, and that's because it really kind of is. That's the pumice and potting soil with a bunch of sedums planted. You're looking down onto the community garden beds. If you look in the far distance, you can see snow on the mountains. Um, people were dying to get things planted. That's why that big white row cover thing is there. There are plants growing under there. But it was really still pretty chilly, and there were several feet of snow up in the mountains. Next slide. So we, uh, this is what it looks like we in have the a summer. From, uh, from our audience, um, uh, Dolly Frank asks, uh, how much did the dome cost to build? The, the package for the dome, we have our dome is 22 feet. And the package, I think, was around $12,000. You have to do a little bit of work before that. You have to put in, um, we have high winds here, so we had to put in some concrete piers for the dome to attach to so it just didn't pick up and blow away. But they have different sizes, and they're all different, all different costs. And they do ship all over the country. I highly suggest you buy one. <laughs> They actually um, have uh, go out of country as well. They have several in South America and uh, all over the all over the world. Really, it's an amazing growing system. Actually, you should tell them about the, the salad. Oh, and so uh, we had a community dinner just last week, the last weekend, 
And even though we got two feet of snow yesterday and the day before and on the weekend, uh, prior to that snowstorm, I harvested huge, huge bowls of salad out of that grow dome to take to that community dinner. So for people that in Colorado in February to have fresh greens and a fresh mixed salad, they were just ecstatic. And there wasn't so much as one little flake of lettuce <laughs> left over <laughs> at the end of it all. It was, it was pretty fun to bring it in and everybody said, where in the world did this come from? I said, just right over there at the library. And I don't know uh, all of the costs involved um, with the entire garden. Uh, Judy would be um, more knowledgeable about that, but we did spend over $200,000 on the garden. On everything. On that everything. Was the entire budget, yeah. And most of our labor was free. <laughs> so it did, it did have expenses involved in it, but um, all of the work was done by the community. So what you're looking at is probably maybe July, I would say. Um, you can see we have a lot of perennials and a lot of native plants. All of our plants were grown by a local greenhouse owner who has a small business here in town. Um, she looked at the plans. We had to have a landscape architect do our plans for the garden. In Colorado, that was a rule that we had to follow. We couldn't just build it. Because we're a public institution, we needed a, a licensed landscape architect. So she went through and she designed the garden um, with a lot of community input, and she did a lot of plant selection. And when I went to our local greenhouse owner and said, hey, can you grow these for us? She said, yes, but I'm not going to grow those plants. They're the wrong plants for, for the area. So she went through and kind of made modifications and chose plants that would do really well. This is the first year of our garden growing. So you can see how well adapted the plants are to our environment. Um, our trees were also grown locally from um, maybe about 30 miles down the road, which is really kind of great. And even though we have this harsh climate and it's difficult to grow, we have six different kinds of fruit trees. We've got apples, peaches, plums, cherries, apricots, and pears. Our fence line is planted with grapes. We've got gooseberries and raspberries and currants. Pretty much everything that isn't a native flowering plant is some kind of food. And we've done that on purpose so that we could have programs around all of this food. We wanted to teach people how to grow food, how to harvest food, how to preserve food. Um, it just goes on and on. Everything we wanted to be a teachable moment. Next slide, please. Again, here you can see um, pretty much the full garden. The garden beds are in the back on the left. That's the tool shed in the far distance with the living roof. And what you're looking at in the, in the foreground is a Nature Explore area. Nature Explore is, um, they worked, I'm sorry, Nature Explore is a combination of Dimensions Educational Research Foundation and the National Arbor Day Foundation. Um, someone in the Arbor Day Foundation read the book Last Child in the Woods and The Nature Principle by Richard Louv, where he talks about how often kids don't play outside anymore and how important outside play is. Well, we wanted people who were bringing or were coming to the community garden to bring their kids, but they didn't, we didn't want their kids picking everyone else's vegetables. So we decided that we would put in some of these Nature Explore areas so that the kids would have something to do and the parents would feel that their kids were safe. Uh, we put in five, but there are actually 10 different areas for outdoor play. Um, they found that, that these areas support math learning and foundational skills in little kids. This one is our music area. Uh, the blue thing is called an imbarimba, which is like a large xylophone. It's made locally here um, in Durango. And the square things with the holes, those are slap drums. So you sit on the drum, and each side that you slap will make a different sound, a different pitch. And so this is, um, this is one of the most popular areas in the garden for kids. And it's also really popular for adults. We do uh, morning yoga here at the library. And one of our yoga women goes every morning into the garden before her class and plays the imbarimba, and then goes in and does yoga. So it's kind of a cool thing. And if you look on top of the shed, um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's, it looks like a stick with a ball on the end. That is a camera, and it is facing our beehive 
we have a beehive on the roof of the shed to um, pollinate all of our plants. We have a local honey man who takes care of the bees. We will be harvesting honey this year. Um, we've had beekeeping classes that he teaches, and we'll, we'll be having mead making classes with the honey that we've harvested. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, one of the ways that we want to continue our fortune is by asking our community uh, to uh, continue to um, contribute to our library and be a part of it. And so we have a, a number of different initiatives going, one of which is um, engravings of these um, beautiful marble benches um, that were installed. We have five of them in the garden. and. We're uh, asking uh, for $5,000 for the um, right to be able to engrave these benches with um, some kind of um, message from a donor. We are also um, asking money for pavers um, that uh, I don't have a good uh, shot to show you, but I'll pitch in in a little, in a little bit in another photo as to where we're actually paving the whole east side of our library that uh, is the space in between our library and the garden. Next slide, please. So we're going to go back just a little bit here. Um, deer and critters are a big problem in our town. We have herds of deer that roam around the town itself. <laughs> and they eat everything in sight. So we had to build a really nice fence around this garden to keep it safe. And in order to save some money, one of the things we did is go to BP, which is obviously big here in the West. British Petroleum does a lot of oil and gas drilling. And so our fence is made by um, a local welder who got about $30,000 donated by BP for this pipe. Um, he also built that gate. It's a handmade gate and it really does keep the animals out, which is quite wonderful. Next slide, please. This is the dry arroyo between the library patio, which is on the right, and the garden, which is on the left. As you can see, this is um, when we were first starting to build. Every drop of water that falls from the sky in Colorado yes. is already owned. We cannot collect water, although we very, very much want to. Because we have such little rainfall, um, it would very much help us if we could you know, collect all that water that fell onto our roof. So when we built our addition, we did have all of the water go to a back corner of the library, and we're just waiting for them to let us collect it. Um, until it does, the water can flow down this dry arroyo. It looks like a dry riverbed, and we've got some bridges, as you can see, going across it that take you into the garden. And this also, this slide shows the patio, as Judy mentioned to the right, that eventually we want to uh, completely cover up with pavers. Right now, we have just um, constructed a pathway to kind of give everybody an idea of what it is we're looking for. And when Judy talks about um, low rainfall, um, what's our average, 15 inches a year? 11 to 15. 11 to 15 inches a, be, a year. So I know that's, that's hard to imagine as a Floridian. Next slide. This is you, Shelley. OK. So uh, again, you can see in the distance um, where the pavers are going to be going in. You'll also see in the distance a large movie screen. And uh, during the summer, uh, we now have all kinds of fancy, what's, what's the name brand of that furniture again? Lowell, L-O-L-L. -L -L. Lowell Furniture back there. And we have wonderful, wonderful, at one point we showed us a Star Wars movie and had over 200 people. Um, from the community come and view this movie. Um, on the right is our indoor-outdoor fireplace. Uh, we showed you a picture earlier of the uh, permanent piece of art over it um, from the inside view. Uh, what you want to mention the, um, the fire pit. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Say that. Talk about that. So in front of the movie screen, it looks like there's a little gray circular area. That is a gas fire pit that we put in. Um, we wanted to be able to have a lot of programs outside 
in the garden area during the summer, not just movies. And so we put in a fire pit so that we could have music around the fire or ghost stories around the fire. And that has actually been really popular with the teens. They like to roast marshmallows there, too. Next slide. When would you say that slide was? That was probably first year. First, first year, year and then, first year. And spring, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's no problem yet. Um, this is one of our favorite pictures of the garden. It shows the nature explorer areas. It shows the shed. You can see the beehive and the camera a little better in this one. And in front of the shed, there's a steel shade structure with a trellis that our welder made as well. And it has a, that has power to it. So in the summers, we can um, have a band under there. When we had our, our garden grand opening, we put a, a band under there. We also have a cooking cart like you would see at Walmart or one of the big box stores when they're giving you samples. We, take, we can take that cooking cart out into the garden and do cooking classes there. Um, with fresh vegetables that we harvest as we go. Next slide. So this shows a picture of a family harvesting out of the, the gardens. Everyone was blown away by the amount of produce we were able to get from these beds. Uh, we had more than we knew what to do with. We've had more than we've known what to do with out of the, the grow dome. It has been just wonderful and hopefully uh, part of what the garden club and library are looking to do this season is to get involved with the elementary school. The local elementary school has some raised beds, but they're kind of in a in disuse. We rehabbed them some last summer, and so we're getting some teachers on board and going to try to to get more community involvement in there and get the kids growing at that level, even uh, as young as uh, second grade. And that way, we've got uh, we can get the people from both directions. We can get the kids, we can get the parents and get more people growing their own food and more aware of where their, where their food comes from. Being uh, fairly isolated down here in the southwest corner of the state, they estimate that if, the, if something happened and the trucks couldn't get in, we'd have three days' worth of food before all the grocery stores would be empty. So uh, it's really important to, to me and to other people that, that more people learn how to grow their food. And the, the garden has just been such a wonderful experience. The kids just can't get enough of it. I was in the grow dome in December, which is, I still can't even believe it. I took pictures for myself so I could remember. <laughs> um, and I was harvesting cherry tomatoes in there. And all of a sudden, three little heads popped up. I don't even know where these kids came from. And they were all of a sudden behind me and said, hey, what's going on in here? What are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just picking some tomatoes. Would you like to have some? And the tomatoes at that point were pretty high up on the trellis. And so I reached up and I got a few and I handed them to the to the little boy who was next to me, and then I reached back up to get some more, to hand him a couple more, thinking that I would just add to those in his hand. He had already eaten all of them, and he probably ate 25 tomatoes that day, just as fast as I could pick them. So it has been such a wonderful experience to have that. And um, next slide, please. <laughs> Can we save snow? No, we can't save snow either. <laughs> yeah, we wish we could save snow. <laughs> this is just another picture of uh, some of the squash. Squash are super easy to grow around here. Uh, that's another thing that the Garden Club is hoping to do this year is have a zucchini fest. And 5,000 ways to eat zucchini since everyone can grow zucchini. Um, it, it will just kind of add to the, to the fun of everyone getting out into the garden and get more people involved. And uh, the, more, the more we can do, the, the, more, the more people get sucked into the whole thing. Next slide, please. Oh, this is Gail. This is our yoga chick who does yoga in the morning, gardens in the afternoon, and plays the Imbarimba in between. You can see all of the things she has growing there. She's got beets and carrots, it looks like to me. Um, what else is in there, Cammie? I see some squash, squash on the there. right hand side. If you look over her left shoulder or what looks like our left. Um, you can see 10 foot tall sunflowers. We kind of got people interested in sunflowers and that was really fun. In August, they are, they're just amazing. And all of those flowers, we've tried to incorporate all the flowers and then with the perennial plantings, it's been just fabulous for the insect populations out there. We haven't had any insect control problems. Again, we do it organically. Uh, so there are no sprays or anything like that allowed. And we've just created a really wonderful habitat where we have the beneficial insects there to control any of the pest insects. 
The worst problem we've had is a little powdery mildew, um, and that's you know it's spread by insects, but that's all just a result of humidity, which is such a rarity around here. Um, the Pine River Shares is a community group that got together a little bit more than a, a year ago trying to address the food insecurity. And so all the food that's grown in the dome, we try to funnel through there or into library programs. So when we have more food than we know what to do with, we take it over to Pine River Shares and they get it to people that don't have enough to eat. So they have access to uh, delicious, fresh, organically grown, healthy food. Um, we're going to try to extend that into the elementary school. We have a tool lending library uh, right here at the library where people can uh, get tools out. We're working on a seed library. Um, there's a few more things Judy's going to tell you about. And if you'll go to the next slide, please. So this summer, we're working on getting a map made of the garden. Um, a lot of people come in, and they're very, very interested on what plants they are. They're just growing so well. So we're going to do a map and put up some signage. We're also going to add a Weaving a Life loom, which is a six-foot tall loom. You pick flowers and um, grasses that are growing in the garden, and you weave them into that loom and create a living tapestry. Um, bugs love it. Birds love it. People love it. Kids think they're, aw they're really awesome. So we've got a lot going on that we're still working on. And every day, I think we get suggestions for programs. And people come in and say, when are you going to? And we've decided our answer is yes. So whatever we can do, that's what we're doing. So yeah, we set aside about $1,500 this year for uh, programming just in regards to the garden. We're hoping to have a garden party of some kind, although we haven't started the organization of that. Um, and that will go along with a STEM fair um, that we're putting together at the end of our summer reading. So um, as you can see, this is, um, this is a library that is well-deserved uh, for the 2014 Best Small Library. This is, um, and it's not just the people at the library. It's people like Cami in our community who um, all come together and partner together to make our place um, uh, a little a little better place uh, to live. So um, I think we're within a minute of our of our timeline here and uh, are now open to uh, questions for the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, I guess I should say one thing. One of the questions that the um, organizers asked us was, what would have we done differently? And you know, we kind of look at each other and scratch our heads and. We don't want to come across as not being humble, but um, everything went really well. And a lot of that was due to the planning up front. And what else, Judy? Just I think because we were just so open to community involvement, when and it, again, it's that yes, being able to say yes. When people asked us for things, we said, yes, we'll do it. And we'll figure out a way to make it happen. But, you know, it's all about planning, and it's all about listening to your community and letting them get involved and have an opinion. That's what built the garden, because they showed up, they built it, they helped, and now they use it. And I don't think we could ask for anything better than that. Tammy? Except an additional garden that never <laughs> set on the other side, <laughs> because we don't have enough beds for everyone that wants one. And we do <laughs> happen to have an extra lot available. <laughs> so OK, we'll open it up to questions now. Okay, we want to hear from you, um, our audience out there. What are your questions for about this library garden? And the one question that I had, you said your board originally was um, couldn't quite figure out the, the linking. So how did y'all eventually convince the board to go with this? <laughs> Uh, we pestered and pestered and pestered and just kind of said, you look, this is what people are asking for. This is what people want. And I think that enthusiasm is contagious. So every time we talk to them, we show them pictures. Um, you know, it's, it's about being driven, I think. You just have to decide this is what we're going to do and find a way to do it. So I don't usually take no for an answer very well. <laughs> and it's a small enough town that if you get enough people talking about it, then those board members are going to run across somebody who's talking about it at the store or, or 
at the library or at a school function, and the the word just keeps building and building on itself. We are our town is only uh, about 1,800 people, although our district, our taxing district, is about 8,500. So we're we're still relatively small, and um, as a as a taxing district, we get 90 percent of our revenues from um, property taxes, uh, and our annual budget is around uh, $700,000. Thanks, guys. Um, we've got a question. Do you work in the garden dur well, you're during work hours? Every chance I get. <laughs> <laughs> we do our best to get out there as often as possible. Um, Actually, the Garden Club is the oversight committee for the community garden beds. I'll let Cami explain how that works. Um, this year we had a, a lottery system set up, and so everybody could put their name in a hat and uh, be chosen for a bed. And people have the option to have the bed for two seasons, and then they can go back into the lottery. That way we hope that the people who had a garden the first year and had some, some mentoring from the seasoned gardeners, then they can take it to the next level the second season, and then they may get, if they get lucky and they get in the raffle, they could have that bed for another couple of years. Um, we have, we have the, garden, the garden accessible all the time from 6 in the morning till 10 o'clock in the evening, so anyone can come in and work at any time uh, that, that within those hours, and then we partner up and, and do as much as we can that way. Um, any of the, when we know that there's going to be a library program with some around food. We try to see if there's something in the dome that they could use for that, um, or if there's something that they know they would like to do. We're, we're hoping that we can start growing towards that. Uh, we have organized work days through the, the uh, garden club. We'll just set up a day and say, okay, can, you know, who can show up here? And sometimes we get 30 people, sometimes we get uh, 15 people, but it's, it's really just always worked out. It's, we seem to manage to have the right amount of people for whatever we had to do. We've just been really fortunate. Everybody's so behind this whole project. I have another Judy question. Uh, comment. I was a pest for several years, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, pests to get pests, right? <laughs> how do you do it? We also have a question about um, how to start a community garden in an urban setting. On the roof. <laughs> <laughs> or, or vacant lots. Uh, there are a lot of programs out there. Um, you might, uh, let's see, isn't it the Community Garden? I think it's the Community Garden Association. If you Google Community Garden, you will find um, tons of websites. But there's a, there's a national organization that has all of the information that you need step by step. And there are several organizations that do grants for, for uh, community gardens. That's what we're hoping to be able to do with the elementary school is if we can show the partnership between the garden club and the library and the school and involved parents, then there are some grants that we can apply for to try to create more of a community garden at their site. They have uh, several decent sized beds, but the, the wood that was made, that was uh, used to make the beds is pretty marginal and uh, there's just nothing around it. It's just these beds out in the middle of a little bit of grass. So that's where we're headed with that. Um, I'm, I'm kind of learning how it all goes on that. I wish I had a little bit more in-depth information, but there is a ton of stuff out on the web for people that have done it before you, so you don't have to recreate the wheel. And honestly, it is so easy to create a community garden. You can put them anywhere. You just need beds. You don't need raised beds like we do. You can just, you know, mask off a place on the ground, and everybody gets their 10 by 10 or 8 by 8 square. The best thing to do is just do it. Jump in and do it. And there's a, a great book that's called Strawbell Gardening that we're going to experiment with as well. So if you have a place that has uh, contaminated soil or really poor soil, you actually season the mills and you plant right in the straw bales. So that's a little demo that uh, we're going to do with the Garden Club this year and see how it goes, because there's a lot of lousy soil around this area. We have a couple comments from Judy. Uh, first, our leadership team gave us the opportunity to use 10% of our work time for a project we are passionate about. And that is how I was able to get the time I needed to organize the garden here at Pasco. And uh, Judy also shares, Will Allen in Milwaukee is amazing uh, with a huge urban garden. Nice. That's Judy. 
Judy also suggests that tower gardens are good for urban areas. Other comments, questions? We have a comment from uh, Lemoyne who writes uh, that they had a program using recyclable uh, items, uh, natural compost, uh, no chemicals or pesticides, especially for people that live in apartments uh, that don't have a backyard or land to plant. And they ended up having two classes, um, a total of 69 participants uh, as part of their adult summer reading programs. Fantastic. Yeah, you know, that's really fantastic. The thing is to find out what people want and provide those programs, and I know everybody understands that, but, you know, it's not just about, it's not just about the books and reading. I mean, we, gardening was huge here, and we wanted to find a way to bring people into the library who weren't readers, and gardening seemed to be the best way for us to do that, and it has really worked. So, you know, Everything's different in Florida. I understand that, but you guys have such an opportunity to pull people in, and everything grows so well there. We're very, very jealous of that. So you know, you can really, you can really take advantage of that. It, it, oh. The only problem with Florida, this is Judy Curran speaking now, is we had a, a freeze last week, 27 degrees. It got down to, and we had frost and everything. We yes. did lose a lot of our plants. It was gorgeous two weeks ago, but we lost some, but we're towards the end of the cool season crop. We'll be starting our new season March 17th, and we've had a great response here. I only have eight beds that are six by eight, or four, I'm sorry, four by eight, and then I have uh, a four by four that's raised up on blocks, and I've got somebody in a wheelchair that's using that one, and we use hey. kitty pools. We drill holes in the bottom for the, for the children to just freestyle garden. I'll give the child a pack of seeds, they plant them. So whatever happens to grow there is just for the kids to learn and to, to play around with. And that's been working pretty well so far. That's a great idea. It really is. That's a great idea. We may steal that. Yeah. <laughs> that you can oh, please do. <laughs> I love it when people steal. From <laughs> I've had, I've had a few people come in and say, I'm going to do that at home, and that just that's what I want. That's what I want. Exactly. Doesn't that make I you feel it. great? One of the things that happened at this fall was we incredible. would see people out there picking seeds and cutting off the seed heads from all of our flowers. So we know that yeah. this year there will be a lot more flowers in Bayfield. And some of those seeds were actually yeah. brought to the uh, Garden Club meeting last week and are now planted in the flats and in the dome, uh, hopefully coming up. We planted, oh, Lordy, I don't, I lost track of the number of flats that we planted last Thursday. So we, we're just getting started with our cold weather crops, but it's happening. Yeah. Well, we're going to get into our hurricane season. That's going to be our challenge. This will be my first hurricane season here with this community garden. That's going to be interesting. Well, feel free to contact any of us. Um, I'm not sure, Sandy, if you're going to put our contact information in the um, documentation that you're sending out or if you want us to list it up here. I would suggest why don't you go ahead and put it into chat, but we'll also share it too. But um, whoever wants to, however you want to handle um, questions, whether it's individually or through one person to sort of share with the others, depending. Yeah, one comment I wanted to make with Judy Curran again. We are able to use rain barrels here. So that is how we've exclusively watered with the rain barrels so far. We haven't had to use any of our county water to keep this garden going. Oh, we are so glad. Not being yeah. able to harvest. Yeah, if only we could do that. Not being able to we harvest. Use a lot of mulch. <laughs> mulch yeah. is a big thing for us. Yeah, that's why I started thinking it. about the snow, because you collect it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, It'll if melt there was eventually. a way, we'd have already figured that out. <laughs> but all of the snow yeah, that falls on there is, uh, I'm sorry. It, we need it for the groundwater. If we don't have a good snow year like this, we, we really have to 
worry during the summertime. And we're still only at 60% in, in southern Colorado here. Yeah we, yeah, we need more. We're hoping that the, the prediction of the next 10 days of snow all will come to fruition and we're just buried and begging to dig our way out. Somehow I think that the Northeast would be happy to send you some up there. <laughs> yeah. I have friends flying in from the Midwest today, and they're, they're excited to come this direction. I said, well, it looks like you're bringing it with you. So. Uh-oh. Well, that's good for you, I guess. You know it is, and they want to ski, so they're happy to bring it. <laughs> we had 60 degrees last week, too, so that was, that was really hurting our snowpack. Wow. So, any more comments, questions? I think we'll just, for those of you here in the room right now, we can continue talking. I have, our last hour was going to be for discussion, and I'm going to encourage anybody who wants to, to stay. And I'd love to hear uh, our audience share one idea that you heard today that you're thinking about implementing. Uh, it would be really good to hear what, um, resonates with you after uh, attending one or more of today's sessions. So we'll just keep our line, go ahead and just keep it open and uh, until we get into past three o'clock and we'll see how many people want to stay and, and do any uh, questions, discussions with each other and with our presenters that are here this afternoon. Thank you to Pine, the folks at Pine River Library for doing this webinar for us. It looks like you guys have the most incredible setup there, and we're all very jealous. Come visit. We would love for you to come visit. <laughs> we might take you up on that. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> Dolly says she wants to come visit, too. We don't have hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We've got a hand up. Just go ahead and unmute yourself, and you can... Um, speak if you like. Oh, I was just going to say I really like the um, the music area for the kids with the xylophone and the, the whatever those drumming drumming things were. If you go online and just Google Nature Explore, you'll find um, they have a beautiful website. They have trainings all over the country, and um, they have schematics for all the different kinds of areas that you can you can do for them. One of the things that we did, we, one of our board members was having a very large cottonwood tree cut down, and we mm -hmm. brought that tree here to the library and made a balance beam out of it in one of those areas. So we made stepping stones at different oh, heights out of rounds from the tree, and then two balance beams from the tree. And that is an area for movement and balance. And not only do the little kids love it, but we see a lot of seniors out there using it as well. So definitely Google. Do you have any problems with people? I'm sorry? Okay, thank you. But do you have any problems with do you have any problems with people like getting hurt out there or any of that kind of stuff? No, not at all. Um, the Nature Explore areas Good. have rubber mulch in them, so if anyone falls, they kind of bounce. Um, and <laughs> I'm surprised nobody asked a question about the bees, because that was our probably biggest issue. Everyone was afraid they were going to be stung. I'm allergic. <laughs> but the bees were they are so happy with the plants. I think we had one bee sting the whole year last year that we heard about. Um, you know, you can't stop bees. If you have a garden, you're going to have bees whether you have them on your property or not. And right. they have not been an issue at all. That's good. That's good. I grow a lot of flowers at home, too, for that reason. If the bees have the flowers, they're not going to bother me. <laughs> exactly. We have a comment from... Well, and you're seeing a whole lot of beneficial insects that you don't even see that are really small that are taking care of your pest problems. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a bug nerd. Judy's <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> Candy is such a bug nerd. We're going to build a bug house as well this year. Um, you use anything that's tubular, and you build a frame and put all these tubes in, and then the bugs take up residence, and they kind of take care of your garden for you. And of course, I'm a bug nerd from being a fly fisher. I, I take my little sen on my rivers and 
and uh, figure out what bugs are floating downstream so that I can match my, my flies to the hatch. And I hate bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Can't stand them. They love my hair. like them. We have a comment from Laura Doyle. Um, I forwarded two great ideas I heard today. Home Harbor's partnership with The Haven, Domestic Violence Prevention Info via webinars, and Citrus County's Reading Pals program, teens getting literacy training and reading to kids in the library. Those are great ideas for implementation. Thanks for sharing, Laura. How are you doing at that I'm unmuted, so I'm going well, I have to go now. Thank you so much. Appreciate it all. The new one. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Let's see. We're, we're almost 3 o'clock, and we'll stay a little bit further into I can't imagine there's going to be anybody who's signing in for the discussion, but it could happen. And anybody else want to share uh, your ideas you heard through the day in chat? Would love to hear from you. Let's see. I'm reading Susan's comment. We're still chuckling over Jean's creative partnerships in Palm Harbor, Tales and L's and Funeral Home. Creative and cool. <laughs> and thanks to all of our speakers today, all of our panelists that came in and, and shared what they're doing and what they're, and all their great ideas. Um, and thank you to Sandy for setting all this up and Patrick for helping it run smooth. So it's been, um, it's been quite a day, and we're glad that all of you joined us. We're going to um, edit the recording that we've been making today, um, and we'll get it up on YouTube as soon as we can, but it may be a few days before we get it all spliced and edited and uploaded. Uh, this is Patrick again. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thanks very much to all of our presenters. Uh, if you all would not mind uh, completing uh, the survey after today's session, we value your feedback very much. Thank you. And we would like to hear from you and with the evaluation, what you liked as far as the format, the content, the presentations, and also suggestions for, for change uh, uh, with this, or any kind of follow-up that you think would really be good. Hi, Sandy. Can you hear me? Yeah, we sure can. Go. Okay. No, I, I, I was just testing my sound. I just uh, clicked on. So we're really now um, open to uh, questions or discussion. Um, we've had a full day. We've had a lot of people who have stayed through it. There are people popped in and out. So, do you have any additional questions or comments? Next month, Florida Libraries as will be business incubators. Uh, I know we're having gallery later on in the year. Oh, uh, disaster preparedness, of course. Nolly's coordinating that. That will be coming up. So tune in. We're doing different formats and different things depending on the topic. like to hear any educational programs that you're actually uh, providing. Uh, if you could drop those in chat, any partnerships you have. 
Susan writes, my colleagues like the idea of Gene's Collaborative Professional Development Day between two library systems. Absolutely. Thanks, Susan.